Every meeting we're going to switch. You're getting score updates on your phone through the night. No. Oh, oh I am. Genius. Yeah, yeah. It breaks my heart. I know. We're not going to make it go. Linda, by the way, I did. Sounds like huh? You did give me a brand new one. Sounds like I found it in my desk. Are you ordered? Is ICTV? So. It actually had two batteries ready, too. And it works. It ready? <laughs> right. But it's okay to have a new one. <laughs> okay. Um, seeing that there is a quorum, I'm going to call the um, October 18th school committee meeting to order. Order. Um, and we're beginning, at the beginning, I'll read the motion. Um, we're going to go into executive session. To protect the bargaining position of the board, we move to go into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining, negotiation strategies with respect to non-represented personnel, and return to open session at approximately 7 p.m. I think I need a roll call on that. I'll yes. second it. Okay, second. And um, Mr. Morgan? Yes. Ms. Yes. Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Robinson? Yes. So it's a 4-0.
Return on October 18th school committee meeting to order. Um, we're just returning from executive session. Um, we'll just go through. What I'd like to do is just before um, before we open for public comment, and I have the sign-in sheet here, I would just like to make sure we go through the agenda. There was a late, um, um, unforeseen addition to the agenda. So, um, as people know, I believe when we do public comment, it's for items that are not on the agenda. So I'm just to quickly go through uh, for our, um, I actually don't have any old business right now, but on our new business, we're going to do a first reading of food service policy, and we're going to have a, a presentation on the FCAS, which is a, um, we appreciate it's a very lengthy presentation, and we're very excited about it. We're also going to um, make an evaluation and a vote on our MASC, MASS annual um, de delegate designation, and we're going to vote um, a consider a vote of joint sponsorship of a rally that has been organized by Red um, for this coming Sunday, and that was the late breaking item. And then we have our um, information. So. Um, our public comment, just so the folks in the public know, the public is public comment is on items not on the agenda. We usually ha have it for about 15 minutes, and I have a couple people signed up, so we're going to go in order of uh, how people are signed up. So, um, Mrs. Downey, and I'd like to ask that people come to the microphone so that it can be on tape and. Thank you. Um, Mary Ann Downing, 13 Heather Drive. So I have um, just three, three things to talk about. Um, obviously, I'm going to mention something about my support of what's happening over there. An MCAS comment that is unrelated to the scores, and maybe I'll just get to that. These arrived in my mailbox about an hour and a half ago, and I please next year can we have the MCAS score meeting happen a little bit later than when we get the score the parents get the scores I haven't even opened them I haven't had time to digest them and I'm not alone I know we are a big district with thousands of reports to send out send out and parents want to have to look uh, parents will get more out of the presentation if they have time to digest and I've talked to several other people who just got them today so just just as a thought on that and um, before I get to talking about the teachers, the other quick topics I had were um, kind of budget slash hiring questions. Um, I'm a town meeting member, and sometimes town meeting people message me or ask me questions about what happened to this in the budget. One of the questions I got a couple of weeks ago was what happened to the elementary chorus? Because this, um, I recall, and I even went back and watched, asked RCTV for the um, meeting video because we didn't have the slides and it was said that there would be $25,000 for restoring elementary chorus and some two games in the athletic schedule and this parent said well the Josh Wheaton teacher told me there's no elementary chorus this year so uh, excuse me, um, Dr. Darty, please yeah. respond the positions were posted and no one applied for the positions okay so what happened I'm just curious, how much of the 25000 that was in the um, town meeting slide went towards elementary chorus? These are the stepping up positions. I think it's, it's under $5,000. So if nobody takes that position, can the money be reallocated to other needs in the budget? It, when we do our projections at some point, we could take a look at it. Okay, because uh, the other thing this same person told me was at, at Eaton, she had heard there were some para um, shortages of para hours, and the music and art teacher were having to work, cover lunch, doing para stuff, so that's, maybe that's the money. That's not accurate. That's, right, you, that's, you can say that's that. not accurate. Okay, well that's what, anyway, so that so there's money anyway that from the chorus. And um, at the first, uh, the August 30th school committee meeting, you mentioned there was an 0.6 FTE high school computer science teacher that wasn't filled, and I haven't seen the rec for that. Was that filled? The position uh, has not been filled. We are, we are still trying to fill it. Um, they've done some restructuring of the sections for first semester, but the position still has not been filled. So students who would have class with that teacher are still getting they, a, t a class? They are taking other classes instead. 
So the classes were canceled then? The classes were not canceled. The students are taking electives from in other classes instead. We're not, we didn't fill those sections with kids. We reassigned them to other electives. Uh, not computer science electives necessarily? I, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. I don't know the details. We do have other computer science yeah. classes. Okay. Yes. Danny, I just want to make sure we have a couple of other Right. Buttons. So the last thing I was just going to mention was in my support, in I, I know you can't comment on collective bargaining, and I understand one of the sticking points with the, with the teachers is the amount of after-school meetings. And I can't pretend this was an exhaustive search, but I looked at about a half dozen of our peer districts, and not only did they have either fewer meetings than us, one of the things that I noticed, maybe you guys can take into account, and again, I know you can't comment, is specificity in time that these meetings were. We, our most recent contract said our, like three afternoons a month, and these other meetings were very specific, other, I'm um, sorry, contracts were specific about, you know, two 60-minute meetings or no more than 125 minutes of meetings or something like that. And I just hope that um, as, as you guys try to come to a resolution, you don't let this stand in the way because I think we, looking at the Pride survey, the um, teacher, the, the teachers seem to be unhappy with what they're being at, the way their time is being controlled. And I've looked at a, a chart with all of the education levels of the teachers that someone got by getting payroll from downtown, and we have really educated staff. Let's trust their judgment, and let's work, work this out. This is a no-cost point. I hope you can resolve it. Thank you. I'd like to just ask, because there are a couple of other people signed up, and I want to make sure that if there are other topics um, other than those that Ms. Downing has already brought up, I want to take those first. But um, Brian Hanby, uh, Hanley, I might have that name wrong. Um, oh, okay. Um, Christian, it was a, Christian signed in. Does anybody want to speak? And Matt, anybody else? Okay. So um, I would like to, um, typically during public input, the, the chair, um, basically we just accept the um, input. Um, it may not always make a response, or the chair may direct the superintendent and just did to um, respond to specific questions. But I'd like to just um, make a, a response at this point. We have, the school committee has responded um, to the um, emails that parents have been sending. Um, there was a, a press release or a statement um, at the, after the last school committee meeting. Um, and I just want to say that um, Mr. Robinson and I are the, um, the two people who are on the negotiations team um, and have been serving on that team since I believe March, um, working uh, with uh, Dr. Darty and the administrators that are on the team um, and with the um, RTA team. Uh, Mr. Robinson and I have actually um, done this a I think three or four times we couldn't uh, quite count, but um, been on the negotiations team as representatives of the school committee at least three or four times. So the Reading School Committee has offered fair and reasonable terms, including proposed financial terms throughout the negotiations with the Reading Teachers Association. There are many areas where the school committee and the RTA have reached consensus throughout the negotiations. School committee is balancing the many goals of our district that are impacted through this process, and we continue our commitment to fiscal sustainability, attracting and retaining staff and teachers, and the achievement of our district mission and vision. And the school committee continues its commitment to reaching a resolution to the contract. As you have seen from information that's been released to the community, the Reading School Committee and the Reading Teachers Association have filed joint mediation with the Massachusetts Labor Relations Board. Mediation is a process in which a neutral third party, which is a state appointed mediator, helps the parties attempt to reach agreement that is acceptable to everyone. The cost of mediation is split between the Reading Public Schools and the Reading Teachers Association. Mediation is voluntary and confidential. The mediation process differs from a court proceeding or arbitration in that the parties may control, maintain control of the outcome by hopefully reaching a consensus on the remaining issues. In our current negotiations, the parties have reached tentative agreement on many areas with a few items that are still in dispute. It is our hope that the parties will reach consensus on the remaining items with the goal of ratifying the terms of a successor contract. 
the parties will be engaging in the mediation process in early November. So I hope that helps to clarify um, information um, for folks um, in our community and any of the folks who are here today. Um, there's no further public input. Can you please make sure to state your name? Good evening, my name is Brian Gilberti. I don't know if these are working. Oh, they are great. Um, 333 Ash Street. Um, I've been a resident of Reading for 14 years. Um, and there's an old saying that is, everybody loves teachers until you have to pay them. And when I first moved to Reading, I was hoping that this was not the community where that would be true. But everything that you're going to talk about tonight, MCAS presentation, everything else, is directly connected to those people. And I think that that has to be something that we all remember and take into consideration. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's no further input. We're going to move on to our consent agenda. Um, so did anyone uh, we have a motion, but does anyone need anything removed from the consent agenda? Well, hold on. I, I Excuse me, I'm reading off, sorry. She has a public comment. Public comment. Okay. okay. Excuse me? I was on the oh, I did, oh, sorry, I think I said That's Christian okay. instead of Christian. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Kristen Pegoraro. I am a first grade teacher at Killam Elementary School. This is my 11th year teaching first grade in Reading. Sorry, I'm gonna try not to get emotional. I've chosen to speak tonight not only as a voice for the teachers in this town, but as a voice for our students. Because after all, they are our students. Day after day, they come to school. No matter their age, they come through our doors excited, anxious, and eager to learn and be challenged. Some come to school with worried bellies and some with empty ones. Some come to school, learning comes easy to them. And then there are those that learning is difficult for them and they just hope they don't get called upon to read a lot in front of their peers or answer that tricky math problem. Teachers and students have many similarities aside from our buildings on a daily basis. We too come to school with a plethora of feelings. We too come to school excited, anxious, and eager to make education enriching and fun. We come to school and hope to make it a sanctuary for those who need it. We come to school willing to be a voice for those who need it as well. We wake up every morning and come to school because above all else, we believe education is one of the greatest gifts we can give our students. Those same students who come to school with worried bellies because they didn't grasp the latest concept we've been teaching them, but that's too bad because we need to move on to the next thing if we're gonna teach everything we're required to in one year. Those same teachers who just started wrapping their brains around the new writing curriculum, but now have to learn and implement a new reading, math, and science curriculum. We are all struggling to be successful in our own areas. Our students want to be successful in their learning and our teachers want to be successful in their teaching. But I think above all else, all we really want is respect. We are all human. Those students who walk into our classrooms every day deserve every ounce of respect that we can give them, regardless of whether or not they have mastered everything that they've been taught. They are humans spanning from age five to 18 years old, and each of them looking for respect and trust in their own ways. Like our students, our teachers are looking for respect and trust from our administration, that we are still the highly qualified, dedicated educators that they hired in the first place. We want to be shown that we are respected by compensating us competitively to our surrounding communities and show us that you trust us to use our time effectively without needing to control double the amount of meetings this year. When we really need the time to unpack what we've been given to teach and get good at the new initiatives and become masters of our trade again. Many of us have been here long enough to be considered veteran teachers and some of our teachers are brand new to this field and are just trying to survive. Some of us are here in the home stretch before retirement but are still putting in every last ounce of effort before they leave just to make learning fun. And some of our teachers have recently left us and some are seeking other opportunities because of the state that this town is in. Like our students, I came here tonight with a very worried belly. I knew I wanted to speak to the community, however, every day when those students come into school, as teachers, we encourage them to take the risks, and that's what I'm doing here tonight. 
some of our students dream of being teachers when they grow up. And it's time to show them that the teachers in this town are valued and respected by giving us a fair contract. Thank you. No, Sharon, Sharon, okay, Sharon, if Sharon has any. Yeah. Great. Welcome, Hello, Sharon. Thank you. Yes, I'm happy to be here. Um, I know that Jean and I exchanged a, an email earlier this week around what she was going to report out on her subcommittee, so I'll leave those items for her. Thank you. Um, in terms of special education, I know we have some vacancies for some teachers um, that we're continuing to try and recruit for. Um, one of those is at the Coolidge Middle School, and the other um, is our team chairperson, who will be shared between a couple of elementary schools. So we've conducted interviews um, for both roles. We are um, moving, moving along through that process, and we just are not yet ready to conclude either process, is where we're at with the staffing vacancies. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is Kelly next. Hi. Um, so I'm going to spend most of my time talking about MCAS from the 5,000 foot view tonight. But a couple of quick updates. Uh, we are busy in uh, learning and teaching. We had a release day on October 5th, which went really well. We had a lot of district presentations um, at all levels. Um, one of the really exciting things was that uh, we fully trained all of our elementary staff in the new Fountas and Pinnell benchmark uh, assessment edition three. So that was done on October 5th, and now we're in the process of using that uh, new system. Can I just clarify there? So our, if, uh, if I recall, the, in our district, uh, Joshua Eaton was using the edition three, and we saw and heard a lot about right. that. Right, Joshua year. Eaton had been using it. But the other schools mm -hmm. had been using Fontes and Pinnell, but edition two. Correct. Okay. And, so uh, the, and the new edition is a little bit different. It's actually a fair amount different. Um, and the Fontes and Pinnell folks chose not to do a real close crosswalk between the two. So, um, yeah, we're really excited about that. So they're currently using them. That training went really well. We had a number of other training. Um, um, we are in the process of planning November 6th training, uh, which is our election day. We have, uh, 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 right now, I think about 15 or 16 different plans for the day, depending on subject, grade, location. Um, so we're ironing out all of those. We have some really exciting uh, workshops planned. We have some work being done at the high school and differentiation. The middle school uh, teams are going to be unpacking some of the MCAS scores further to look for uh, common threads. So we're excited about that. So we've been pretty busy with all of that work. We're continuing to work on curriculum work, uh, especially around the area of the curriculum guides. Uh, the high school teams are working on them. Uh, and we're not going to be uh, ready to show them to the public probably until after the holidays with our uh, NASC visit and all of that, we're, we're tying all of that in together. But we're working diligently on those. Uh, and as they become past the draft stage, we will be asking for public comments and feedback. Great. As you may have seen in the packet that was distributed, we have included, as we have historically, the 2020 budget calendar and this is really meant to be used as guide to let the committee know how we walk through the budget process um, and some of the main areas that we wanted to point out are really the areas that we will be involving the committee we did have the financial forum last week on october 10th it was actually here in the library 
So we have received the guidance from the town manager, so now we will begin working towards building out the specifics of the budget. As we've done historically, we will be looking to recruit some budget parents that we can involve throughout the process as we go through it. The goal this year is similar to last year. We will have an overview budget presentation yeah. on December. Just, just, start, um, just for committee members, it does the schedules after the minutes in the packet. So if you're looking for it, it's the. Sorry, uh, I was sort of searching around. I wanted to make sure that everybody was on the page while we were talking. So right after the last page of the first set of minutes in the um, consent agenda. So similar to last year, we plan to do a budget review presentation on December 20th. We got a lot of positive feedback last year that that was helpful to walk through how we go about developing it, the various grants we have, going through some of the high-level cost center descriptions so that when we move into the January time frame, we can really focus on the budget. The goal is to have the budget books distributed to the committee by December 27th. We will start the budget discussions on January 3rd. Similar to last year, the first night we will do a high level overview and we will then address the smaller cost centers being administration, district wide and facilities and at that point we will also include um, any capital discussions as part of that. On January 7th we have the regular day budget presented on January 17th that is when we are targeting the public hearing as well as the special education budget the following week on the 24th we will address any school committee questions that we've received and that is also when we would anticipate doing the vote so to allow adequate time between all of the presentations the public hearing and time to address the questions for the charter we will be presenting the final budget to the town manager on January 31st. We are scheduled to present to the Finance Committee on February 27th, and then Finance Committee will vote the budgets on March 13th to go forward to town meeting. Hi. Mr. Robinson. Gail, so one of the things I noticed uh, last week and then here, uh, we're the first budget that the Finance Committee is looking at this mm -hmm. year, is that's a change? Why is that? Uh, that was discussed and voted by the Finance Committee. We weren't, okay. um, yeah, we weren't. We weren't necessarily <clears throat> part of that. I think it's to, I honestly don't know why they switched that around. I'm just, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just thinking in terms of time to be able to get ready for that. I think we will be ours will be done um, and voted on the 24th, so that will allow us a yeah, month should, to be able to we should be okay. prepare for it as well as it'll give them about. My goal is to actually give them the budget at the same time we give it to the town manager, so they'll have it for a month. So we'll ask them to provide any questions they have a week or two in advance. Okay. Is there a financial forum in this this financial forum too scheduled or no? No, at this point there is not. Last year it was different with the override and various discussions. As of right now, there has not been a second one scheduled. It, it will be nice to have a budget season that is not quite as Herculean as the last two and especially the last one. So Great. excellent. So yeah, Gail on the schedule the question I had is it looks like we have the school committee overview presentation on December 20th and the budget book going out a week later yes and then we come back with questions right after the New Year's holiday right in the I'm just I, I'm sorry I'm just thinking through the process as it's been in the past I've always found it very helpful to have that book in front of me when we did the overview mm -hmm. presentations in the past, and what are we going to have when we're in that meeting? So the overview presentation is not numerical or financial. It is a high-level discussion about how we develop the budget as well as what the various cost centers are. Historically, we used to try to discuss what each cost center was and what it included during the budget presentations, and we found it helpful last year to have that discussion ahead of time so that when we start the budget discussions, we're diving right into the financial aspect so it's this is specific information. it's not numerical it's more it's the educational piece behind it so people understand the process mm -hmm. and for those who do not participate in financial forum we give a brief overview of what the town manager presented as oh, part right. of the financial yeah. forum right. we did just we did how they much. do the budget <coughs> so i just had another question gail so I remember last year we moved the open hearing up 
but I can't remember the reason why, but we had to do it. And I see it, it's still in the beginning of the schedule, and I guess I don't, I think an open hearing is, is a time when people have heard all the presentations, and then they, then they can come in and say what they want. This is actually going to happen before they've even seen the special ed. If I'm reading no, this right, right? I don't think so. It's the same night, the so same. Oh. the open hearing would be at 7 p.m. Okay. And then we, you, you follow what I'm. I, I I think that the open hearing should be at the end, but that's just. And, and one of the reasons. Which I can't we remember can, why we changed. It was a bylaw requirement that we didn't fulfill. For yeah. days. And one right. of the other feedback that we had received from community members as well as the committee is that if we had the open hearing on the same night as the vote there was not adequate time for the school committee to address questions and comments that the mm -hmm. public brought up so we wanted to make sure we had time for the public hearing and then time for school committee to discuss we that. We schedule the timing of the public hearing though after the special education presentation we can schedule that for 8.30. It has to be at 7, right? No, no. it doesn't. Right. You just have to so specify the time right. and you have to give uh, adequate notice. Okay, so if we schedule it after that. Yep. Piece. Otherwise we'd need to try to fit in your point. Yeah, we could. The other option would be to combine special ed and regular and education on the same Right, but we also wanted to make sure there were adequate time for the presentation so that is one other item we could do is combine special ed and reg ed and have both presentations in the same night i First, think that i might my, my, i'm sorry my understanding of an open hearing is when at least from my perspective i've wanted i i would have wanted to digest things and then come you know how and then come back and trying to have have questions together right after you've seen something might not be okay. what some people like but that's can, up to the chair we can adjust that and have um, we've done it in the past where we have had regular education and special education present yeah. in the I same mean, night we so we it. can do that we can do it yeah I'd, Nick was that I, yeah I, su I support that too I think it'd be cool so it looks like we have if I'm counting right after the budget book goes out and everyone has the specifics we'll have four total school committee meetings. The last one is for voting and deliberation. So working backwards, I like Mr. Robinson's idea of having the focus of that second to last meeting, that third meeting really being public input and, and, and then have using the first two meetings to get the narrative out there and the explanations out there. Because right, the information is kind of flowing into the school committee and the public in the first two. The public is commenting the third one and then the school committee is deliberating on the last one. Right. Right. So we'll like make that. that. We yep. can make that. That's kind of how we always had it. Okay. Let me okay. <coughs> pass out. Uh, we've now passed October 1st. So we have the official October 1st enrollment, um, which we have to send to the state. So I just want to highlight a few things. Um, this probably would have looked much different if we did not have an override ballot question passed last April. So I think we need to continue to acknowledge um, that the override restored several positions or added positions that um, we would not have had. So for example, if you take a look at the elementary enrollment piece, which is the um, by school, um, you can see pretty much our class sizes are in good shape. Well, then we do have a couple that um, grades two and three, they're a little bit higher. But overall, our class sizes are very good. Uh, remember, there were three elementary teachers as part of the override that were restored. Mm -hmm. So um, those class sizes would have looked much different. Um, if you flip it to the other side, <coughs> our middle schools, if you remember, there were seven teachers at the middle school level that were restored um, in grades six, seven, and eight. And then at the high school, we uh, added five positions, five FTE positions um, as well, which um, class sizes are very manageable at the high school right now. So um, overall, our enrollment um, is pretty steady, and our class sizes across the board are very, very good. 
So that's the enrollment piece. I don't know if anyone had questions. Yes. Um, excellent to acknowledge that, yeah, those seven, that's our middle school. We have middle schools in Reading. We don't have junior high schools. We right. have middle schools with a middle school model and seven teachers in foreign language. So, Mr. Um, yeah, I think people, people want to. This will this will be in the final packet that we post. Thank you. And we just handed out some extras. Um, Mr. Robinson. John, uh, what, I think I think the last one that we got last enrollment update grade four at Wood End is that is that was that there that twenty the twenty twos grade four no, and twenty five uh, twenty four twenty five twenty four that's grade three that's grade, grade, grade three, three I'm sorry yeah. yep uh, and then grade two as well right. Uh, Yeah. They're, they're high. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, and unfortunately, I don't have classrooms space that I could add a teacher at Wood End. Mm -hmm. So just something we got to keep yep. an eye on. Yeah. Well, grade three is within your guidelines. Mm -hmm. Right. Grade three grade is when you, it's grade, it's grade two that's, right. that's not. I was looking at the number above. Yeah. That's why. Classroom. The classrooms. Do you want me to continue? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and I know some of this I had in the uh, in the weekly newsletter, but I just want to highlight um, two of our Reading Memorial High School teachers, Kara Gleason and Megan Howie. Uh, they had articles published on Reading history in the Daily Times Chronicle. Um, the, the, it's a two-part um, titled Lives Lived Unfree. Stories of Reading's Enslaved. Um, in the articles, they examined some of the stories of enslaved people who lived, worked, died, and were owned as property in Reading. Um, I think the important thing about this is that they're using the same research process that uh, they're they're asking their students to do. They're modeling that process for for their students, and obviously, being published is is also is also an honor. So I just I wanted to recognize the, the good work that they were doing. I also want to recognize the work that uh, some of our teachers and administrators did um, at the National PBIS Conference in Chicago. Chris Kelly was one of those administrators that went. Um, the theme of the conference was PBIS, and for those that don't know, PBIS, Positive Behavioral Intervention and Supports, creating, uh, celebrating safe and learning environments. Um, this is a national conference uh, that because, and it is funded by the School Climate Transformation Grant, um, that this is in our final year. Um, it's a conference that we've been attending the last several years so that we can learn best practices from school districts all over the country on how to implement the multi-tiered system of, a, of supports um, that we've been working on. So our Wood End team of uh, Dr. Joanne King, uh, the principal, Lisa Breed, who's a school psychologist, Jackie Pelusi, special educator, um, as well as Chris Kelly was there, um, and Courtney Fogarty, who is our data coach, uh, and... Um, Sarah Levesque. Sarah Levesque and Lawrence Bell. Bell. Thank you. Um, who's our uh, behavioral health coach? Um, so they they did a booth presentation. It featured a poster and dialogue entitled "A Roadmap to Building and Implementing Successful Tier Two Supports for Students," um, and they showcased several of the tools that they are using currently in in their um, Tier Two uh, supports. In this. So I just want to I want to recognize that and congratulate them on a job well done on a national presentation. Um, last evening I also had the I had the opportunity to be part of a panel discussion at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Uh, it was uh, on gun violence. Um, it was called Voices for Action. It was the 23rd Panachuk Symposium on Education Research Policy and Practice. Um, on the panel which had uh, many different stakeholders, including students, public safety, uh, teachers, principal, and community leaders. Uh, I served in two roles as a panel member, both as a superintendent of a public school district and uh, co-chair of the State Safe and Supportive Schools Commission. Um, each of us had an opportunity to, to speak and then take, take questions. Um, the keynote speaker was Peter Cunningham, who was the assistant 
Assistant um, Secretary for Communications and Outreach during the Obama, for the U.S. Department of Education during the Obama administration, and, and currently works uh, in Chicago. Uh, he's the director and founder of Education Post, so he was, he was the keynote. So um, it was very well attended. We had about 200 people at the symposium, uh, and it was a... It was a. It was a pretty. I was honored and humbled to be a part of, of that um, panel discussion. And my role is to speak from those two hats and how gun violence has impacted us as a um, as a school district and also from a safe and port of schools level. That is my report. I have a couple. Um, so the CPAC met a couple of weeks ago, and I believe it was Ms. Stewart's first meeting, and um, I know parents were really excited to meet our new interim director of student services, so I really appreciated her being there. The big news out of that meeting is Sarah McLaughlin volunteered to and was elected to serve as chair of the CPAC for this academic year. Um, Personally, I've been Sarah for years. She's a really smart lady and a strong advocate for students with special education needs. So I'm ecstatic to have, she's like us, she's a volunteer taking time out of her family and her career to do this work. So very grateful to Sarah. Um, two upcoming dates on CPAC. On Wednesday, October 24th at 7 a.m. in the Reading Police Community Room, there's a basic rights in special education workshop. Um, helpful for anybody in the community who's interested in learning more about special education, but really vital for parents who are new to the system, whose st students have recently been um, identified as having special educational needs and wanting to learn about the law and how it's implemented in Massachusetts. So that's a really good workshop. And the next CPAC business meeting is Tuesday, November 13th, uh, 7 p.m. tentatively here in the library, but it's a tentative location so for all of those meetings people are going to want to check the CPAC website. Great. That's CPAC. Can I keep going? Yes. Reading 375. Um, I'm very happy to inform the committee and the broader public who haven't read it in local media that Cummings Properties granted a thousand dollars to Reading 375 to support an anniversary celebration next year of our town. Um, so we certainly are grateful to Cummings Properties for their generosity, but also to Sarah and Tom Brugalacchio of Innovations and Optics, Inc. This program is a client-directed grant program. They're longtime clients of Cummings Property, and they had the opportunity to say, this is a local nonprofit that I think I would like to see supported. So we owe them a debt of gratitude as well. It's a really nice, nice thing for the committee. Mm -hmm. uh, and on Friday, November 9th, there will be the third trivia night at 7 p.m. Fun night. Everyone should go. November Friday, 9th. November 9th, 7 p.m., RCTV Studios. I, I've done the last two. It's a really family-friendly, fun, fun, fun evening. Really? I have one more uh, report. Dr. Doherty just described a um, panel discussion that he was invited to participate in. What he did not tell the committee is that at that panel discussion, Dr. Doherty was awarded the 23rd Annual uh, Alumni Award on behalf of the UMass Lowell College of Education for being an outstanding leader and alumnus of the UMass Lowell College of Education. Um, so I just wanted to share briefly with the committee what, uh, what was shared with the public about Dr. Doherty that night when he received this honor. Um, Dr. Doherty has a Bachelor of Science degree and his Master's of Education in Curriculum and Instruction from the University of Massachusetts as Lowell and his doctorate from Seton Hall University. Since 2015, Dr. Doherty has been a member of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education Safe and Supportive Schools Commission. He was elected co-chair to this commission this year in 2018. Much of his work is focused on promoting the social and emotional wellness of students in Reading and across the Commonwealth. In 2016, the Middlesex Partnership for Youth, Inc. presented him with the Dr. Patrick A. Scatini Jr. Award for his regional leadership in social emotional learning and the Massachusetts School Psychologist Association presented him with the Friend of Children Award for his continued effort to improve the lives of children. In 2018, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents recognized his significant contributions to the field by presenting him with the Christos Daulis Award. Um, so that's a really wonderful honor for you and I'm sure the whole committee offers the congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rasky, do you have one other update that you might have? Gotten too early. I'm sorry. We're too early. No, too early. No. There's a ball game on. A lot of us are very interested. Don't know if anybody knows a little baseball being played tonight yeah. in Houston. <laughs> Mr. Robinson. I don't have a liaison report, but I did want to mention. I think most people know that uh, Dr. Nyan uh, had successful uh, kidney transplant surgery. Yeah, yeah. 
earlier in the week and I think he came home today or, or tomorrow so yeah. keep, say your, keep your prayers for him and hopefully that continues successful mm -hmm. thank you thank you Dr. Doctor, would you like to do your Sure. I have a RACASA liaison report. Um, so at the um, RACASA annual meeting, they reported on the town and school programs which engage parents, police, and educators to support and educate people about the issues of substance use disorders. Hidden in plain sight happened um, and had a steady stream of interested adults. Part of it was seeing, um, the interest was in seeing all the hiding places that are sold. It's quite unnerving actually. But also the conversations that happened between people that went. I found it really interesting when I was volunteering there. Um, and also gratitude was expressed for the work of the RACASA board, the outreach coordinator, Julianne DeAngelis and director, Erica McNamara. And there was a wonderful surprise because it turned out that Erica McNamara has come back to us. So she will be director again of the Reading um, RACASA. So that was great and that got a huge ovation. Um, Dr. Sherry Vandenacker, who unfortunately can't be here today, um, gave a very poignant presentation and personal presentation entitled, What I Wish I Knew When Someone You Love Suffers from a Substance Abuse Disorder, a Substance Use Disorder. And her talk actually can be seen on RCTV um, and the link on YouTube and the RCTV YouTube channel and the her talk can also be read in the Daily Times Chronicle in the October 5th issue. Um, she spoke with wisdom, hard earned through personal family experience and I highly recommend watching her give the talk. It was powerful and helpful. And the, the article was in the Reading, um, her talk was in the Reading Chronicle mm -hmm. October 5th. Um, okay, that's agenda item three. Okay, so I have a couple quick reports. Um, I'm the HRAC liaison, and I attended the HRAC meeting, and I can't remember exactly the date of it, but um, the voted HRAC voted to support. Um, there's a ballot question, ballot question three. They voted to support that ballot question, and they also um, voted to basically ask the, the board of selectmen to discuss and potentially support that ballot question. And the selectmen are actually going to do that on October 30th. Um, just so that people are aware, the ballot question, um, uh, the ballot question would, if it fails, will remove some laws that protect transgendered individuals in um, places of public accommodation. But in terms of the schools, I want to assure the committee and um, Dr. Darty and I have consulted with our attorney and um, I since heard um, Representative Lewis speak on this, so I'm incredibly clear now. But the law, in 2011, laws were passed that uh, provided the protection of, uh, for transgendered individuals in schools, housing, and employment. At that time, um, Jason Lewis actually spoke of the struggle that it was that that by that when they passed that in 2011, it was already a five-year struggle. And at that time, they removed the public accommodation from the law. So that's why we, as a school district, um, you know, this is something that we've been working with for a long time. And in 2016, they passed the law in, uh, um, for public accommodation. So the ballot question could change the public accommodation, but it will not change in any way the 2011 law that provides protections for transgender individuals in schools, employment, and housing. So I just wanted the committee to be clear. And again, Jason Lewis uh, gave a talk. So um, this week, actually, Dr. Doctor and I attended a event and um, I, uh, that Red had, which was um, to inform people about the question. And um, so that's why I did hear Jason Lewis sort of explain that. And he was obviously lived and breathed that as he was um, uh, doing it as a senator. But also I just wanted to acknowledge that um, a member of our guidance department was um, 
that evening, a great job on a panel. Sarah Muner, did I say her name right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did a great job on the panel there. And let me think. Um, like the rally is going to be, we have an item on the agenda, so I think that's it. Can I just add mm -hmm. a point on that? Just um, we talked at that panel about how the students are protected in the schools, but as we know from our um, from our emotional, social, emotional, behavioral. Um, programs here that students actually bring in their experiences from outside of the school and so we do protect our students in the school but they come in vulnerable from what they're experiencing outside of the school and the panelists were very clear about how students um, are looking to see who's going to support them through question three and who's not and um, that makes them even more vulnerable and it's a population that has a an exponentially higher suicide and suicidal yeah. ideation um, rate than their age peers and so they also talked about how important it is for people to show their support for these students and for people in gen in in general who are trans so to think hard and get educated and freedom for all has a website so if you're wondering you can refer to that website for additional information um, and it's a great website with myth mythbusters and um, information there's a lot of fear that being um, promoted by the um, opposition to this bill and it's important to really get educated about it um, violence prevention experts and um, police are supporting a yes on question three because there is no evidence so um, I just wanted to make the point that children bring in what they experience outside thank you thank you um, I think we're ready to go on to our new business so um, Kristen Thank you, and we want to especially thank you for bringing us a snack. Many of us thank have you. been here all day. Some of us got here at dinner time at 5 or 5.30, and we're appreciating the snack. Oh, you're welcome. Well, I know you had an executive session, so what a, it's always self-serving when I'm nice. No, I'm just kidding. There you go. Um, <laughs> it, I just wanted to let you know these are things that we've started serving the students. Um, the breads I brought specifically because there are five flavors. We, we don't just do them. Um, we tried some of them last year um, with some parents at the Parent University because we um, sponsored the snack for the students and the parents and took it as an opportunity for a, 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 a communication opportunity with parents to have a little back and forth but uh, they're a whole grain bread this is what they look like when they're wrapped and the kids can get them and the flavors that I put on the little cards we can get banana pumpkin zucchini chocolate uh, blueberry and, and pumpkin pumpkin seasonal though um, <laughs> But I only brought it because it was just something different, and um, we are really trying. Breakfast is not our biggest program at the middle and high school, but we just thought that it always take an opportunity to show you what we're doing. And the parfaits just seem to be, everybody seems to like them wherever we bring them, so you need a little protein. Um, but the reason I was invited tonight was to discuss with you something that's been um, in, in the news for years, um, unpaid meal debt for students. And we've had a strong policy for many years, but as the world evolves and changes, um, our, our department, although we are very um, good about following the law and policy, um, has felt very uncomfortable uh, with some of the things that we've had because we don't want, we want to do what's right for kids. We always want to put the kids first and um, not having money to pay for a lunch or parents who haven't applied for free or reduced lunch or put money on an account is really not a student's problem. Um, and so we don't want to be in a situation where we're going to have to take a meal away from a child and give them an alternate lunch. Uh, we've been able to avoid that even though it was in our policy, um, but it, it, it just is getting more and more challenging. A lot of people, um, the charges have increased slightly but not dramatically in the past few years and we've had a really good handle on it, but we want to make sure that 
before in in Massachusetts there is a bill in Massachusetts that they're they're nicknaming lunch shaming uh, bill that could pass in Massachusetts which would require this in the future now I don't know what that bill will have so this may not stand if that passes we may need to change some things but I think this is a good attempt at um, getting on the right page mm -hmm. so uh, I had done some research got a lot of different policies from other towns Wakefield um, where I worked there as well had uh, decided they wanted to redo their policy it's a little bit different than this but um, this a, a good portion of this came from um, Milton Public Schools and some from Bill Ricca and some was from ours um, but we wanted to kind of put it in a, a much easier to read document that was more about the content of what the intention was and try to put everything simple for parents um, so I know on page one there is a s missing under borrowing meal f meals for a meal money for a meal um, so there's a typo in there that I already caught but and I know you you go through and read it but are there any I don't know if there's any questions about it before we start or how you want to handle going forward or if you want any background of why well, I just want to have um, dr. doctor read our motion to um, so we'll accept that to, to get that motion on the table and then we'll do the questions. Okay, okay. Move to accept the first reading of revised policy EFDA collection of payment for school meals. Second. Well, now we'll continue the discussion. All right. Mm -hmm. um, did it, anyone have any questions on the draft, new draft policy for specific questions? If I can, if Dr. I can just Harvey. add. Uh, Usually when we do the policy review, if there are questions that crop up in between, then they would send them, the committee would send it to us ahead of time. And then we would answer them for the second reading. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I thought was important to note um, is that we added a section about donations towards student yes. debt because uh, Gail and I actually had worked on last year. Um, some people had, we have the seniors when they leave, they have to either pay their debt before they get their cap and gown or we have to know if they want us to move the money to a sibling or give them a reimbursement or um, some of them just leave it there and they never tell us what they want to do. So we have some things towards student um, debt where it has to do with the donation so we had uh, adopted kind of a procedure of how we would manage it and we thought it was good to note it here so that if people were looking at the policy they would know how we would handle those monies and principles and, 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 and I would not have to guess of how to give out the money at least this is transparent so that was never in the policy before so I just wanted to note that two, two questions do we have any kind of outreach to students who are graduating with and leaving a balance to say, would you like to donate? Yes, we. so what we do is we start in May and we send out um, emails to all the senior parents and tell them that they need to start looking at their balance and start either spending it down or thinking about if they've kept it high, what they'd like to do with it and telling them the options. And then we kind of send those out intermittently as we get closer. And then once it's graduation week, um, once they've gone into finals, and we know they're probably not going to eat again, but they could, um, they, they start having us move it to siblings. Sometimes it waits till the next year and we can get into that account. Um, they kind of sit in grade 13 through that year, through this year, and then, and then we can move it, so. And how, how much unpaid debt do we typically have across the school? We typically run between $800 and $1,000 through the year, and we usually end with less than 300 Wow. But our policy has had teeth. So we've had account caps and things like that in the past. So I did express a fear that this could grow and I might need some additional support. Right now, the managers at every building send out electronic uh, notices, a minimum of once per week, letting parents know if their child is, has any debt, a penny or more. And they send the middle schools, I think, send out low balance alerts because the parents there have asked for that. And, the, and it does note in here the options for parents so that they know they can set low balance limits on their online account and it's all they can use it all for free and it will send them an email letting them know when it's at the balance that they want to know when they should reload so um, we don't we haven't had a really bad uh, problem in running and I'm hoping that we can stay on top of it and we do really well with free and reduced students who don't reapply trying to communicate with them one-on-one -on -one and, and, and solving those things on their own. But I just fear that without the account cap and without some of the 
issue penalties, then we could run into a problem where it might grow. So I don't want to be here next year and have you say, why did it grow? <laughs> so Kristen, uh, on the section we're borrowing money for meal. Yes. Uh, so I'm just, and I throw this out to the committee, I guess. I don't think that milk should be, I, that should be part of the borrowing and not not considered one of the three I guess so it should be three plus the milk so the milk is part of a meal when you buy a meal but if you bring a meal from home and you didn't have a milk we would let you charge a milk right but the way that's worded is you if you're borrowing for a meal at least the way I read it is if you pick three out of the five and one of the five is milk what no I'm, okay it, no that's just defining what a meal is so uh, a meal as recognized by the united states department of agriculture is a minimum of three of the components no. so milk is one of the five offered components they could take all five if they want it's just that they couldn't come in and just take a slice of pizza um, and charge it they would have to take an actual meal with fruits and vegetables but they could also charge milk just right, by itself so, but my question question is, yeah. uh, does the milk go toward the three that they get to take? Yeah. It, so I'm no, it's not just three. They, they have to take three, but they can take five. So maybe we want to reword take five it. Five in, um, in a bar. Okay. They have to the, to a reimbursable meal. They have to take a minimum of three components. But they have five offered. Is that Correct. what they can take? Right. And, and but they and they can take up to five. Right. So if you wanted, if you were charging a meal, you could take a hamburger on a bun with yeah. strawberries, carrots, and a milk. So there's your five components, and you could take all five, but you would only have to take three. You could take a hamburger and strawberries then you could still get your meal charged but you have to take a meal the USDA is really really specific about what meat what a meal is and so if we're going to charge it and hit that meal button it has to have the minimum number of components but we, we would let the absolute feel meal we're not limiting them to three I, I miss, mm -hmm. I miss yeah. right. nope that's fine thank you um, I was just wondering can you talk a little bit about what it's what it it's like when a child can't have an a la carte item. Yeah. Like, what, what are the a la carte items, and are they, is this, um, how frustrating is it for the children that they can't have that choice if they don't have the money? So it can be it, it can be frustrating because it's whatever is like extra or a snack type item or they could come up a lot of kids will have a bag lunch and want to come up and buy an apple but if they don't have any money they, they can't buy anything that's not part of a meal so if they've exhausted their money and they charged a meal and they want to buy an extra slice of pizza we usually say do you have money and they say no and we say you can't get the extra thing you can just get your meal sweetie just tell mom and dad and you can add it to your account we try to minimize the impact on it um, but I'm sure some kids do get a upset if their friends are buying something and they want to um, they can't but we try to make sure that they're fed and ready to learn at every meal but the a la carte stuff you know it is the extra stuff so we need to make sure that they have cash for that so if there's, um, I'd like to try to move move it along so this since this is the first reading and see if we can approve the first reading and then remaining questions um, would go through Dr. Doherty so sure do that um, so the motion was made and it's on the table. It was seconded by Mrs. Sprowski, I think. Um, so all those in favor of approving the first reading? Aye. And that's five to zero. Thank you very much. Thank and you. especially thank you very much for some sustenance tonight. Um, what was that? We have the... Oh, Mrs. Kelly was up for the and past presentation. Hello, good evening everyone. Uh, my role here tonight is to try to unpack the MCAS uh, from last spring, as I'm sure you read in our memo that went out several weeks ago. Uh, the state really um, did a great job, I think, of really looking at our accountability and really making it, I think, a more fair playing field. 
um, our schools and our districts are being compared within ourselves uh, and less comparison with other districts, which I think is really exciting. Uh, I have some question about some of the targets they set. Uh, the, the targets that they set for this year are baseline targets, so it'll be interesting to see where they go from this year. Um, so my job is to sort of walk you through what the new accountability system looks like over our MCAS results at sort of the 5,000 foot view of the whole district as well as some small um, details around school or grade level uh, results. Just so you know, all of the principals will be sharing school specific MCAS scores. I believe at the, their November meeting, so yeah, most, you'll of be, November most of them are in November. Um, and as we go along, I'll be talking about some of the data digging that we've started to do and will continue to do. Um, we'll talk about the accountability report, which thankfully uh, the state has gotten rid of those numbered accountability, and they have a better determination of accountability. I think that we will all agree it's, it's a better way to assess uh, accountability. And again, it's new, so we're still unpacking it. Um, so most of you probably realize, but last year we unveiled year two of the next generation MCAS. Some people refer to it as the MCAS 2.0. Um, and that was done in grades three through eight in math and ELA, and it was all computer-based. Um, most districts are completely computer-based. Reading is no exception with that. Um, in addition, last year they continued with what they call the legacy MCAS. I call it the old MCAS. Um, some of it was done computerized, but it was still the old test. Mm -hmm. um, and it was assessed differently. I'll get to a little bit of that. That is the grade five and eight science. As you know, or you may know, we do science in fifth grade, eighth grade, and then they call it a tenth grade science. In Reading, we do it as a ninth grade science. Our ninth graders take the biology test. Um, and then the 10th in math and ELA, which is required, the three tests at the high school level are required for graduation requirements, as well as part of our accountability. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit about the new accountability system. I'll do my best to walk you through it. It is pretty complicated. Um, and the state, uh, when I delivered the memo, they had released the accountability specifics about, what, six or seven days before that, yeah. John? So we didn't have a lot of time uh, before that went out at the um, beginning of October, and we're still unpacking it. Uh, but just so you know that um, Every Child Succeeds Act, the ESSA law, which is the federal law, really outlined what states had to do to be accountable. You may remember that whole No Child Left Behind situation that we're in, um, and then there was some waivers around that. Massachusetts was one of the states that had a waiver. There were many others. Uh, the ESSA law is now sort of supplanting all of that work, and we now need to report out on many things, some of which we hadn't reported out on. Massachusetts was ahead of the curve in a lot of ways. We had already looked at growth, we had already looked at achievement, we had already looked at attendance. There are many states that weren't, and now that's a requirement federally. So this is uh, the next generation MCAS, which is that newer MCAS 2.0, um, which frankly we're still working on understanding that. The questions are a little bit different. They got rid of uh, the formulaic stuff. Uh, for years and years, the old MCAS had that super long um, fourth grade composition that was all day writing. Now all of the writing is embedded. So it is a very different test. It is done on the computer, which obviously, uh, as an early childhood person, I have some concerns with in third grade, especially um, how much of that is user error and things like that. But our kids, our kids are doing pretty well with it. So within this achievement level, this is the next generation, they gave us the scores and they basically, it's from not meeting expectations in the 440 uh, to 469 range, partially meeting expectations in the 470 to 499 range, meeting expectations 500 to 529, and then exceeding expectations. Now again, um, as we heard, the student letters were just sent out, so parents are still unpacking this. They will really be addressed at the building levels. Uh, all of the information around what, where did your child test, what does that mean, those kind of questions. So some highlights. We had some really strong scores in ELA in grades third, fifth, sixth, and eighth. 
and we had some really strong scores in math in three, five, six, and eight. This uh, detailed chart was in my memo that went out to all families. Um, but I think it's kind of hard to read on this, but it's in our packets as well. Um, one of the things that we like to do is group meeting and exceeding expectations because those are two things that we, that's sort of our benchmark. We would like all kids to meet them and, or exceed them. Um, and our scores were really a lot higher than the state in almost all the categories. Um, and we're really excited about that. Overall, when we grouped all of the scores, we were about um, 17 or 15 points higher than the state average in exceeding and meeting. So when we look at the change in scaled scores, the next page, one of the reasons why we included this in our slideshow um, is really to look at the state average versus Reading's average in the change from 2017 to 2018. Because each MCAS is done um, separately, they don't regurgitate a lot of the same test questions. The ones that they release um, are gone, <laughs> um, but the ones that they don't have, uh, MCAS is one of the few tests in the country really that changes a lot variability. So we look at the state scores, and when we see that scores have gone down, that's sometimes an area that we go, oh, okay, then that this year's test, 7th grade, was harder. So for instance, when we look at grade 7 ELA, the state went down 2.1. We also went down 2.2. So there was a little variation between the state. Now in most cases, we're much higher than the state, so that's really what we'd like to be, is our benchmark. But we also take a look at this data because each test, each grade is so specific. Um, and all of the students take it. So, for instance, in grade 7 math, everyone is taking the same test statewide. There's only one grade 7 math test. There's only one grade 8 math test. Those kind of things. So we look at the state averages, and then we look at our averages, and we say, all right, do we do a lot better than the state? We hope so. And if we didn't, why didn't we? So if you look, grade four ELA district wide, that we didn't do as well as the state did from year one from 2017 to 2018. So that's something that we're in the process of unpacking. What did the, the, and of course the challenge is always that they don't always release all the questions. So standards mm -hmm. they're aligned to, but we don't always know. In fact, we know very few uh, questions. Any of them that are released, we'll be looking at. So that's what this slide is uh, to show you. Um, and then this is just a change in our overall scores of how we have improved from 2017, which is the first year of this new MCAS, MCAS 2.0, uh, to this past cycle. And some pretty dramatic um, changes. Now again, you might say, oh, geez, what happened in grade seven math? You went down 11, you know, that where your difference between um, exceeding and meeting is 11, which obviously that's something we're looking at. But when you go to the slide before, you look and you say, oh, well, everyone in the state went down. So that obviously grade seven tests look differently than last year. Obviously it's a different group of cohort kids, but we certainly are not minimizing when we look at negative scores from one year to the next, we certainly look at it. Overall, um, we're, we're looking at that pretty strongly. This is our, uh, so we also have our sort of old school MCAS uh, test, the legacy, they call it. Um, and they're judged a little bit differently, but if you look at just because we're talking about where we were advanced and proficient, from 2017 and 18, our grade 10 ELA, one point up uh, from the last year, grade 10 math down. Now, when we look at the, uh, wait a minute with your questions on that because we'll look at the overall math scores, which are pretty strong, but certainly that's something we're going to be looking at. Uh, grade 9 science, 6 per, um, percentage points down from the year before. Grade 8 science, uh, minus 4. And grade 5 science, up 11. So one of the exciting things, I think, from a curriculum perspective, which is, of course, my hat that I wear, is that, uh, as you know, the district put a lot of time and money to elementary science curriculum. In 3, 4, and 5, we're now doing some additional work in K to 2 this year. Um, we're seeing the fruits of that labor. This is the third year of that implementation, so our fifth graders 
that took the test last year had it as fourth graders and as fifth graders. The kids who take it in 2019 will have had third, fourth, and fifth. We fully expect that to pay dividends in eighth grade as well. Um, but we're definitely looking at that from a middle school perspective of you know what does that look like. Overall, our science scores are usually pretty high. Our fifth grade is a dramatic jump. Um, and I think it's because of the work that was done prior to, to me coming to the district um, and the work that continues to be done by the, the elementary uh, science team. So if you look at these slides, these slides will show you grade by grade um, where we kind of measured out from 2017 to 2018. So again, for the most part, we try to group exceeding and meeting into one ball of wax. Sometimes we go down a little bit in exceeding, but then we go up with meeting, and overall our meeting and exceeding is higher. Um, in this case, grade eight, we actually went up in exceeding, and we went up in meeting. So that was pretty exciting for us. Overall, there was an 11% change in eighth grade across the district. Oh. Sorry, skip seventh grade. Seventh grade also um, had a few challenges. Our exceeding stayed the same at 15%. Um, our meeting expectations, I can't read it from here. I, I went used down the five. wrong glasses with me. 55 to 60, is that what it is? Yeah, it went down five, yeah. It went down five. So you know, that's something that we'll look at. Um, that means that a few more kids didn't get to that meeting expectation, which is definitely the, where we would like to see our kids uh, reach that achievement. Uh, first grade had an overall exceeding meeting of up 4%. The exceeding expectations jumped quite a bit um, to 19%. And again, I can't read that for whatever 53 reason. 53 to 50. Thank you. 53 to 50, but overall our, our numbers were higher there. Grade 5 also went up exceedingly well in ELA. We went up 16 percentage points overall, and you can see some pretty dramatic gains there. Grade four, um, although it'll, it did go down a bit, it minus two. You can see this is what I was talking about. Although our exceeding went down a little bit, our meeting went up a little bit. So instead of being four percentage points off, it was only two. But we certainly are looking to close that gap. Grade three. 12% in exceeding and 54, that's a jump of 8%. Grade 8 math, jump of 13%, which is a real high jump for us. 15% um, in exceeding and is that 58? Yes. In meeting? yes. Sorry, I should have grabbed the glasses up there. Yeah, Sharon, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully that'll help. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, so grade seven math is definitely one that we are unpacking to find out why we had less students meet expectations than we would like. Uh, an 11% drop for us is, is huge. So we're definitely going to be unpacking that um, in the weeks to come. Again, the, I started with the state averages. That test was a harder test. The state overall went down, but our numbers went down more than we would expect, looking at just the Reading perspective. Uh, grade six went down one percentage point, but overall, I think 8%, uh, we, we doubled our exceeding scores, which are awesome, and our meeting expectations were relatively close. Grade five math, overall a jump of 7%. Grade four math, um, fourth grade often tends to be uh, a tough testing year. The test seems to jump quite a bit from third to fourth grade. I think uh, having actually served on one of the writing teams for MCAS in third grade, I worked on that for about three years. Uh, the third grade is a mindful test with the child's developmental level and really thinking them as an early test taker and then they hit fourth grade. So I think in general most districts see fourth grade as sort of a hard testing cycle because the test looks a lot different than the third grade test. Um, but again, we're going to look at that. Mostly, I would say, our meeting expectations were even from last year. It's We have a few less meeting, uh, exceeding expectations. Third grade uh, math within one percentage point of last year. Uh, relatively high showing there. 
So I'm going to continue unless you have questions about that specific part. Yes, Mr. Bowen. Yeah, I actually have four, but I'll okay. just one. Um, just the, the quick question I have is what's going on with grade 4 ELA? So when I, when I look at all of these, that was the only one in the slide. The excellent slide, by the way. I, I always go right to the negative in my personality. <laughs> I, I, should, I should absolutely. This is a really nice presentation. I appreciate that. Um, the thing that jumped out in the slide, they don't have them numbered here. Uh, it's the one that says MCAS changes in scaled scores 17 to 18. Is it further up? Yeah, it's right at the yeah. beginning of your presentation. And it's the only area where I see a big negative in RPS and a big up in the state, a big positive in the state. Yeah, yeah, that was one that I highlighted when we first started talking, yeah. um, when I first started talking. Yeah, I mean, that's something that we're definitely unpacking. Um, I mean, our work mm -hmm. that we're doing on ELA this year, it's strong. We're doing a lot. Uh, as you know, last year we did a writing workshop this Writers year. Workshop. Uh, we're doing reader's workshop. and. And um, we're doing a lot of PD embedded as well as the curriculum guides that um, have now been shared with all teachers. So I think that the fourth grade teams are really looking at that strongly to say, are we actually hitting all of the standards? Sometimes with the test, it's as simple as missing one standard item. Um, I know a couple of years ago, I worked with a team that hadn't fully finished the fractions unit in fourth grade. So every fraction question was wrong for the most part. And there were six questions that year. Another year, there'd be two. So it, it significantly impacted. Now, I will tell you that we have not unpacked it to that level of detail yet. Um, next Wednesday at our elementary release days, we are working to every school. Um, I know Eaton has already done some of the work, but all of the other schools are following the same protocol uh, where every single teacher in the building, including specialists, kindergarten teachers, first grade, second grades, because MCAS is a school-wide thing, um, our learning and teaching department help the principals with kind of coming up with a protocol where we're digging deep into some of this data um, and then dividing up by grades and really looking at it from that uh, ten, you know, very, very intense look. Good. You had other questions? I, I do. I can let other people speak too. Um, Up to you. Okay. I just have, can I, was yours negative? No. Sorry. No, I, 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 I was just going to say. Very neutral question. Okay. No, I have a, um, I was just looking as we were going through looking at the not meeting and I think most of the, most of it, the not meeting went down, which you have to, which is right for, um, uh, 2018, right? You want yep. fewer kids not meeting expectations, and that looks like a pretty good story for for most of it. I mean, I know those numbers are really are very low, um, but um, they moved generally in the right direction. And when we talk about the accountability, we'll talk a little bit about how the state has changed the accountability system to have us really focus on those kids that aren't meeting. Okay. Yeah, Mrs. Gross. I have a question. Um, when you're <laughs> when you're looking at all of the factors that might explain a dip or a peak. Do you ever look at the cohort of students? And what made me think of it is, and my memory could be wrong, but my memory was last year our seventh grade scores were particularly high, mm -hmm. and now we have eighth grade scores that are particularly high. You know, at some point you say, this might just be a particularly... That is challenge. absolutely... Yeah, yes. and then I imagine that, you know, even though that's a wonderful thing, it sort of sets a bar that's unrealistic for the next grade. So well, we're like going to talk about the targets uh, that yeah. were set for us, especially at the high school, uh, yeah. and that's part of it. When you do well, they set high targets. So, um, and that's great. We want to do well. Uh, I, I tend to look more at the kids that aren't making the meeting expectation and what can we do. But yes, that's part of why we unpack this at the district-wide level. We kind of walk, we've already done uh, district-wide data meetings about MCAS, and then we walk principals through sort of a protocol of how do we dig deeper. And they have to do that at the building level because they know the cohorts, they know the kids. Right. You know, there, are there any surprises? What are the trends? Um, and really look at it, even at the grade level, at specific students even. Like, was there was this a shock to you? And if the answer is yes, then why? Mm -hmm. Great, great. Thank you. Mr. Bob. Yeah, so you got one of my four off the list. So uh -huh. two. So Thanks, so Jane. Question is how does grade, any of, how do you compare in all of these graphs, you're always comparing this year's grade to a different set of yep. students last year who took yep. a similar but not the same test. So, 
you know, where, where you have a, a dip, you know, comparing, well, let's say, take the grade four ELA example, look at grade, yeah. grade three ELA and see if, you know, if there's yeah. something to be learned there. But the, the second question I had was, I noticed that consistently, going back to in the slide before the one I was just on, so with the big data table that you have. Yeah. And I've noticed this for a couple of years that I've been looking at these scores now. We seem to have between one and four and one and three students numerically that are in that partially meeting expectations, mm -hmm. right? It has a 25 to 35 percent. Mm -hmm. That's the student group that for me, I'm very interested in the why, like why that, what mm -hmm. supports can we offer those students to, to help them to be you know, doing better. Not that these tests really measure everything about a student, they don't. But have we looked at subpopulations in the same way the state does in that group and really looking at do these students, this one in four, one in three student who's testing in the partially meeting, do they have things in common? Are there, you know, characteristics that they share, and, and those could be a wide range of things. And I know the state probably has a whole list of things. So it de I guess the answer is it depends. If we have more than 20 students at a grade level in a subgroup in a school, then we have information about that because okay. we get those scores. So for instance, if we had 20 students in third grade at a certain school that were free and reduced lunch, um, we would have that score. We would know how that population did. But, uh, you know, because writing is small, and we do have sort of small pockets of um, um, what the state would determine as high needs populations, we don't always have that at the school level. Um, so yeah, we look at that, but I think in some ways at the school level it's more individualized than that. It's more that whole MTRS um, stuff that we do with the tiered support of saying, all right, are these kids that are getting intervention? Are these kids working with our tutors? Um, we're just finishing up the AMC testing. As I said before, we're doing the Fountas and Pinnell testing. Those kids that are not meeting benchmarks, they're already on our radar, especially at the elementary level. Um, and in seventh, sixth, seventh, and eighth, at the release day, we're going to be unpacking MCAS and say, all right, so look at some of these cohorts. Now what? What are we doing to differentiate instruction so that kids that are not or are predicted to not do well on the MCAS this year, how can we bolster that? And, you know, certainly I think Reading is particularly mindful of we don't teach to the test. We want to teach really well to the standards that are, are required. If we do that, we should really do well, right? Um, but some, there are many districts that teach to the test, worksheet after worksheet, packets after packets. You know, our teachers are skilled. We trust their judgment. We're working on it. And, you know, I think you, somebody, whether it was Jean or you, said it, you know, this is a snapshot in time. This is two days in, a, in the life of a child. Um, and it is the only kind of big test we have, but it's by no means the only test. When we meet our data team meetings, um, district-wide and school-wide, we look at other things, like attendance, uh, which is now part of our accountability, too. Um, we look at the Fountas and Pinnell benchmarks. We look at AMC. In many of the subjects at the high school, they look at, you know, uh, common assessments and midterms and things like that. So, you know, it, it's it's definitely a piece of the puzzle, but it's not the whole puzzle. This last one. Okay. Curriculum. Yep. So I like your point um, connecting the improvement in science for yeah. fifth grade with, I think it's the No Adam curriculum mm -hmm. that the taxpayers have generously mm -hmm. helped us fund or funded almost exclusively, actually. Have you, throughout the curriculum, been able to identify you know, cohorts of students and see if there's kind of an enrichment in scores or statistics as curriculums or pacing guides or whatever? Are you able to match the input of effort in, in, in your role of you know, helping teachers kind of stay in sync with the curriculum and the pace of education in their classrooms with, and, and, and the implementation of new curriculum as we buy them, new mm -hmm. materials, with how these numbers are. So the, the no Adam one is a nice one because it's really easy to, sh to pinpoint, right? Um, in the four months I've been here, no. No, I have not been able to do that yet. Um, that's the goal. That's my three to five year goal is that we can really focus that closely and say, oh, okay, hmm, like we just spent a lot of money on science at the high school. That should really help our science scores um, ultimately. Maybe this year, hopefully definitely next year. Uh, usually curriculums take a year or two to really seed. Um, 
um, the, the most companies will tell you three to five years. I think, again, in Reading, we have uh, pretty good luck with training our teachers. They are skilled. They work hard. Um, so we get there. Um, but yeah, I mean, for instance, all the work that we're doing on Reading Workshop right now, will that pay off on our elementary ELA scores? Absolutely. I think one of the things, just being um, a resident of Reading and having a little bit more historical <laughs> data than perhaps any other new assistant superintendent, is that um, for me, consistency is key, right? Mm -hmm. So we have, we've had pockets of high scores and low scores or schools that out of the blue didn't test well and you're like, whoa, what happened? I think for me, what I'm focusing on is that less silification of schools that, you know, well, we're trying this, so let's try that and really saying, all right, this is the benchmarking. We expect every school to try this and do this and use this and then we still want your school to have unique culture points. Mm -hmm. Of course, every school does that well. Um, but I think that that, as a curriculum director, that's my goal, is to get, you know, it shouldn't matter what school you go to, and they're all good schools. This we know. Um, as far as testing, we see that. Um, and I actually, one of the things that John and I were remarking on is our schools, elementary school to elementary school, don't look that remarkably different, which is exciting. But occasionally it happens. Um, this year, and when I get to it, you'll see the middle school scores looked a little different. Next year could be completely the other way. Our middle schools are very, very similar in curriculum. That surprised us as well because we look at it, we meet with them, those two principles work like this. Um, and they're very, very well run and well run together. So that's kind of like, okay, what happened there? We have to really pack, unpack that. Some of those we don't have answers to. And you know, next year, if we have another year of it, we'll now be like, okay, obviously we didn't think we had a curriculum problem, but maybe we do. So, I mean, these are all important questions. Great. I was going to add, um, this discussion came up when my children, who are 24, first started school, you, the elementary schools, it was two superintendents ago, and the elementary schools were so different, you could have been in a different district. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was it's startling how different it was. Um, you know, I, I know that it's sometimes it's hard. You know, we, we worked hard on this committee. We talked about it a lot about, you know, aligning on the mm -hmm. new edition of Fontes and Pinnell mm -hmm. and that that's important. I know that that presents, you know, work in alignment for the schools that were not on that edition um, anytime we have to implement that. But I think to, it made me recall and think back to the differences. And at that time, there was absolutely you know, dialogue uh, beginning to happen about, you know, we should make it consistent. So I think we've done a tremendous amount. I think in a short time, we're already much more consistent. And again, I, my kudos to the principals and to the coordinators that are working so closely uh, with myself. Um, we're, we're having a lot of very meaningful conversations about sort of like, this is what we expect all schools to do. And then certainly, you know, every principal wants to add personal touches mm -hmm. to their own school. Yep. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, this one. Okay. Um, okay. Here. Yeah. Yes. No, just on this section. Go ahead. This Ms. is a quick yeah. question about seventh grade now because I had a seventh grader yep. now last year. Have you thought that the, um, I don't know whether you isolated it to be a more difficult test in math or you're still looking at it because last year's seventh grade was the first year that they collapsed the tracks mm -hmm. where it was kids in algebra and then their was in algebra. Mm -hmm. Yep. And using that, and everybody else. So they used to be in the middle track. Oh, right, yeah. And I'm wondering, it was the middle and the slower, and now last year the kids had, the slowest kids had to really, you know, kick it up to keep up with that track. And I wonder if the teachers would report we didn't get through as much, we got through it, and the slowest kids had some yeah. issues, and that got so what I will tell you is that that has not been reported. Teachers haven't said, oh yeah, it's because we do love it. I think they feel like I do. We have to unpack that and we have to say, like, is that part of why the scores were lower than we thought? And I think the answer is probably maybe. Um, we're still unpacking that. Like I said, we're spending most of the day on November 6th unpacking some of that um, by subject area. It was definitely the first thing I thought of when I saw those scores. But it's definitely something, you know, we know that um, for the, for that this deleveling will work. I've worked in many districts that have done this work. It may just be that we might need some more support around differentiation models. And I know the middle school teams have already been working very hard with that uh, this year. <coughs> 
Ms. Sprowski. That inspired another question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, so we've got this sort of advanced track in seventh and eighth grade, and my memory was maybe a year or two ago that there was a different test. Yep. And I'm wondering, is that still the process? How is that reflected? So no, there is not a different test anymore. Park had a different test um, for the algebra kids, but kiddos, but now it's a standard seventh grade math test. It's a standard eighth grade math test. Everyone in the state takes the same test. Gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes, Jeffrey. You mentioned not teaching the test. Philosophical methods. What do you think of, like, the exceeding expectations, like, in terms of bragging about how we do versus other districts? <laughs> like, wow, you know, that's really great. Yeah. If we have a lot more exceeding. But on the other hand, does that mean we spent maybe too much time teaching to the test? And, that, you know, we're actually, we're very happy to get meeting expectations. And, and so when we get to the next part, Jeffrey, it's okay. interesting that you should ask that because I, I've obviously thought a lot about this. Um, when we get to the accountability and we look at the points that are allowed, a three is meeting it. Like the three is the expectation. It's nice to get a four, but the three is really what they expect as the state. So when I first looked at the scores, I was like, oh, oh, oh. You know, I wish we were, you know, if the, if the maximum was 12, I want to get 12 or 11 or whatever. But the reality is the state is really saying you should have a nine. So obviously being Reading, we, we, we want to be higher than the curve, but I agree that I have heard of and perhaps worked at districts that did a lot of teaching to the test. Um, sometimes struggling districts, they literally give MCAS packets and kids spend weeks and weeks filling out packets in preparation for MCAS. That is not the philosophy we have in Reading. We want solid teaching, we want great teaching that aligns to the frameworks. Like I said, what we need to do is look for pockets where we might not have covered a standard. Maybe we didn't realize that there was going to be as much talk about adverbs on the seventh grade ELA. So if we know that, we can be, make sure, okay, how many days or weeks are we spending on parts of speech? You know, um, a lot of the writing prompts have changed. Um, for many, many years, the MCAS had a formulaic of that five paragraph essay, and kids had that down, they knew how to write it, and then the state said, well, on that second the hand, we don't really care about that anymore. Um, and in fact, you know, the way the writing prompts work now, it's a lot more about content than about structure. So really changed, like fourth grade teachers are like, oh my gosh, now I have to teach, <laughs> you know, the timeline approach of telling a story versus this is how you do it, intro, three details, closing. So it really has changed what the state is asking. What, when I mean teaching to the test, what I think we do, just like with anything, if you're going to take a driving test, you have to practice for it, you have to know what the expectations are, you have to know the language, but you have to have enough experience doing the work, the test isn't a big deal, right? So I think, to me, that's a good analogy of being ready for MCAS. We want to use the language of the test, we want to use the style of the test, we want to give them enough experiences so when they get there, they're not like, what is this? I've never seen this before. As a teacher, that's the worst moment in your life. And you can't help them. So you can't do anything to help them. So that, nobody, no teacher in Reading wants that, and we rarely have that. Uh, most of the kids that uh, don't meet expectations, they're kids that struggle, and we are working with them. Some of them are continuing to struggle. We're still working with them. But um, they most likely have seen the questions before. They just might not have answered them correctly that time. Any other questions? Okay, so moving on to the legacy MCAS, the, this is the old MCAS. By the way, this is going away next year, and we've gotten zero information about what the high school uh, 2.0 will look like, the, the next generation. Just like two years ago when the next generation came out, we got zero information before it was released. Um, so in that, grade 5 science off the charts, really excited about that. Grade 10 ELA, really high scores. Um, although when we look at accountability, we can talk about that. So they used a different achievement level altogether. This will be going away after this year. Um, they used advanced, proficient needs improvement, and failing or warning. Um, even just the language seems a lot more prohibitive. Meeting standards or partially meeting standards to me seems like a better child friendly. I don't know how many parents actually sit down and go over their MCAS scores with their kids, but I always felt like when I was a principal and even a teacher with MCAS, 
to get a warning or needs improvement, uh, partially meeting expectations to me sounds a little more palatable to a third grader. Mm -hmm. But um, so this is, and these are the scores, you know, basically 200 to 280. You're probably familiar with this. The only tests that still use this scoring system are the science tests 5, 8, and in this district 9, and then ELA and math in 10th. So that, sorry, this slide is off the chart a little bit. Um, so here are our scores. Again, we look we look at the state versus the district. Science in grade five off the charts compared to the state, which is awesome. Um, grade eight, although our scores you know weren't as high as grade five, way higher than the state. States were at. Um, 35 and we're at 52 English language arts and this is where when we talk about the target areas it's hard we were um, at 96 percent which is really high to make improvement at that high level um, the state was at 91 math was lower math is always lower if you look the state average in ELA 91 the state average in math at the state level 78 quite a differential in Reading we had an 88 so we're still 10 points higher than the state um, and and but certainly lower than ELA and then the science uh, at 81 the ninth grade we give the biology test there are other tests um, typically a lot of districts do the ninth grade biology test the kids take biology it's fresh in their minds they take that test it also gives them an opportunity to retake tests if they have to. And ninth grade is a nice year to do it because you're not testing in any other MCAS except right. for that. Um, so here's some information about our 10th grade English language arts. Um, we, because this is not a new test, we were able to show you a four-year comparison. Um, and again, this is our advanced went down a little, but our proficient went up a little. So it is an overall improvement of 0.1. And you can see we have very, very few kids at the high school that have needs improvement and failing. And just so you know, they do have an opportunity to retake the MCAS. Grade 10 math um, did go down a bit. Uh, that is definitely something at the math department level. We actually, uh, Kate Boyton and I have uh, talked about it and we met with the department chair to talk a little bit more about it. We are going to definitely be looking this at, at a math department level um, of why we decreased. It was a minor decrease in advanced, um, but a few more needs improvement than we'd like to see. And again, back to uh, Mr. Boyvin's question about cohorts. Do we look at cohorts? Sometimes it's as simple as that, that we have um, a needy or cohort taking the test, that's the information that we'll be looking at. Grade 9 science, uh, again, down a, a little bit. 33% got advanced, 48% got uh, meeting or proficient, they don't call it meeting expectations, proficient. And again, you can see very few kids fail it, um, so that's really good. The state average in failing is actually very high. Uh, grade 8 science, Again, a, a mild dip uh, from advanced went up a bit, but our proficient went down a bit, uh, so therefore our needs improvement went up a bit. Oh, sorry. And grade five, which we're super excited about, um, went up quite, quite a bit. You can see the 23 needs improvement and the seven, uh, that, that's way down from other years. Any questions before I move on? Just the science, if you look at it's the cohort question, right? Yeah. We have grade 8 science versus grade 9 science. So I'm assuming that last year's grade 8 is this year's grade 9. Correct. So might it be low again? It might be, but it's a different test altogether. Uh, the eighth grade and the fifth grade test is a compilation of every every science topic that is covered in the years before. So, for instance, when you when you fifth grade science test, a topic from second grade could be on that. Um, and likewise, in eighth grade, any topics from K to seven and through eight could be on it. Whereas the biology test is really just a biology test. In grade nine. In grade nine, they call it the grade. 
10 test just so you know if you see anything uh, with other districts they always call it the grade 10 science we call it grade 9 because we don't test in grade 10 in science that's we just test biology mm -hmm. in ninth grade some districts give kids options um, we just we don't uh, by all every kid takes biology it, it's a better system to just do the ninth grade test we have really pretty good luck with it yep. so I have not a question but just a comment so that that grade eight or that now ninth grade mm -hmm. class is very strong yeah ELA yep. and, uh, yeah, not the science. So, that would be so putting my curriculum hat on, that's something, we're, yeah. So those are the kind of things that, again, one day of testing in a life of a child. But, you know, again, that's an area that we go, hmm, that doesn't quite add up. It's not the cohort, maybe, and it's not this. So what were we teaching? What I can tell you is that our science scores have been higher in other years. And we have a veteran, like, we don't have a lot of new teachers in eighth grade science. So, no. uh because they're very, they're strong in math and yeah. LA and not science, yeah. so that just points me right to the. I mean, honestly, Chuck, it, sometimes it's as simple as, like, it was a bad weather day. I mean, it sounds silly, but, you know, it, it just, the, the, it's one day. So the reality is we don't have, you know, a, a staffing issue there. We don't have a cohort issue. So we will look at it, but, John? No, it's just, it, just to keep in mind, and I think, w I hope it's a trend that we're seeing with grade five. The grade five students from last year had three years of no Adam. The grade eight students last year have had, did not have three they years. Didn't have of they didn't have any. So, and so, and the high school piece has only been in existence for a year as well. So, at grade, and that was in grade nine. So, you know, I think the curriculum changes were making. That was my point. Yeah. yeah that's yeah, and, they, and you have to remember that in grade eight, they're testing them on concepts from elementary school. So if they weren't solid on phases of the moon in uh, mm. fourth grade, they, they probably no, don't know it in eighth grade, <laughs> right? So uh, it's definitely something we have to look at. All right, so student growth. Student growth is part of our federal requirements. The state, uh, Massachusetts was already tracking student growth, um, but a lot of states haven't been. It's now a requirement. Um, when we look at student growth, um, and I, perhaps you already know this, but just to, to be clear, um, when they look at student growth percentiles, they look for a target of 50%, right in the middle. That's the, that's the mean that they want. They want that 50%. Um, when we, you also have to realize that in fifth grade, in order to look at growth, they look at every child who scored similarly to you in third grade, every child who scored similarly to you in fourth grade, and then they look at the growth of those kids, and that's how they do it. Every year it builds on years. Okay, so when you look at the high school student growth, you might say 33.3%. Whoa, what happened? There's a combination of factors in there. Um, traditionally, and, and I know this to be true, we have students in Reading that have gotten either nearly perfect or perfect MCAS scores every year, every single year. Um, and so their student growth uh, rate is very low. <laughs> you can get a perfect score in the MCAS and actually really be very low with student growth. I'm not saying that's all the picture, and we are certainly looking at growth. We want it. We want to. Um, decrease that achievement gap, especially for our kids that aren't at that meeting. You know, that's our benchmark, the meeting expectations. We're certainly not, I don't mean to underscore that at all, but I just want to explain to you that student growth can somewhat be deceiving because kids who don't really change much and their cohort doesn't change much, there's not much growth there. Yes? It's almost like no, no good deed goes on Right, and I and, and frankly, I know this is a parent because I, I did have a student, a child in my house that did very well in the MCAS had very low student growth. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so the, the question I had is, these are calculated for all students, mm -hmm. what you're saying, so not just for students that, so it's not like they exclude the students at the very no. highest level and look at everybody growing no. toward meeting expectations. Is, right. is there any alternative metric of this for just students? Again, I'm focused on that 
partially meet that. So we'll talk about that. They here. they have sort of uh, changed some of the way they look at the numbers, but the student growth is all students. And so when they're doing accountability, they look at achievement in ELA, math, and science if if it exists in that in that grade, and then they look at student growth. Those are in ELA and math. They don't really do um, a lot with student growth with science because you only take it certain years. Um, so, you know, if you look at this, our student growths are, most of them are around 50 or higher. Um, certainly some are much higher. We definitely are concerned when we're way lower than 50. Yeah. 50% of what? So 50% is their target of growth. So compared to like peers who tested similarly with you in every year you've tested, <laughs> you are within the 50% ranking of like right in the middle of every other kid like you. So it's a percentile if you yep. plot how everybody does yep. and you look at the cumulative so yep. half the students have less than you and half the exactly. students more than you. Exactly. And, and you're basically being compared to like students every year along the way. Um, and it is cumulative. It's a very complicated, I can't imagine how the statisticians made this formula, but that, that's how they do it. And they, they pick the target of 50. So that's right in the middle. Anything less, we look at anything more. But again, a, a low student growth doesn't necessarily mean low achievement. It could mean high achievement. Right, so the, just in terms of um, students, so students who scored similarly to you in previous year, so um, I'm trying to sort of get to Nick's focus, maybe we're gonna get to it on sort of the partially meets. Yeah. Um, that those students, depending upon where their score was, you'd be comparing them, their growth to other students who um, also were partially meets, or it, it's it the scaled yeah. score. It's a scaled score, not though. The partially meets. Oh. The, it's the scaled, scaled score. It's before they right. do that. Yeah. Okay. okay so uh, here's a um, average student growth percentile and. Likewise, with the partially meeting or exceeding expectations. So the slide here shows you both. So the reason why this is important is if you look at RMHS, for instance, we're at 88% meeting or exceeding expectations in math, but we're only at 40.2 student growth. So I think that this slide shows that, that in some of the schools, we might not be at 50 yet, so it would end overall in the, the three years of testing. They weren't yet at 50, but they're 63% percent meeting and exceeding expectations. One of the other things that to me is important to note here is that all of our elementary schools are within the same kind of range, either right under 50 or right over 50, which again, um, from a district-wide lens, I'm looking for schools, especially our schools in elementary school, to look very similarly. Um, typically and traditionally, our middle schools have tested very similarly. Uh, this year, we had a little bit of a jump at Coolidge. Um, and again, next year, and that means by no means uh, to disrespect the great work that's being done at Coolidge, but I can assure you the great work is also being done at Parker. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if we had the opposite next year. Uh, but the, to me, it was really exciting to see that our elementary principals have worked really hard at trying to really balance the schools uh, in what we teach. Any questions on this part of the slideshow? Yes, Jean. Something I noticed in the previous section with the high school 10th grade ELA and math scores is a four year shift, mm -hmm. slightly lower advanced while proficient is increasing. Yep. So when you're looking at this percent meeting or exceeding, that might stay the same or as you said, even go up. But behind that, there's sort of a shift. Um, and I wonder if that might be connected to what we're seeing when you see 96% right. ELA achievement, but not maybe the growth we want to see. Do you think those two things are connected? The I think question. they might be and I think uh, to be honest with you the state used to put a fair amount of uh, apples in that basket of like how many percentage kids you had it you know if you increased uh, your advance then you got extra bonus points for it or if you decreased your lowest scores you got extra bonus points the new accountability system doesn't actually do that anymore I think they are looking at kind of that target that we want every kid to be at meeting expectations so let's worry about getting everyone here and then we also want everyone to really set that 50% student growth. So, you know, as, a, as from a district perspective, I'm less concerned about that. Um, you know, it's nice to have advanced scores, but
but it's it's less important you know the kids have to I mean no one really sees the MCAS scores except for the folks in the district right call don't ask for them mm -hmm. uh, as long as you pass the MCAS you graduate all life is good um, you know, if you get it, if you get a perfect score in the MCAS, who knows? Just you, really, your family. And Abigail, and Abigail Adams. And Abigail Adams, right? Well, yeah, you can you can get the uh, tuition at a state college, which is now this much of the whole tuition, right? Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh -huh. Winning. Uh, what is thank I you, Madam Chair. Scoreless. Oh, scoreless. 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 Bottom of the second. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, bitching. <laughs> that was a question, right? Yeah. <laughs> Don't ask me that, because my Red Sox expert's at home right now. Um, so, new school and district accountability. I, I'm pretty excited. Um, I've had about three weeks to unpack the new accountability system. Even when we got the raw scores, we get the raw scores in the summer, but it's really hard to translate them. I mean, they are spreadsheets and spreadsheets, and you don't know what's going to be what level. Um, the, the state was very slow to release things uh, for us at the accountability level of like, what does this raw score actually mean? Because they were creating this new system. So we were all kind of waiting with bated breath of what it would look like. We knew it was going to change because of the new ESSA regulations but we didn't know how. Um, we knew that the one to five accountability was out the window, which I was excited about, but we know what was going to replace it. Um, John and I have spent a lot of time talking about it and discussing it as well as the principals and our data coach. I'm excited about it. I mean, I, I think it gives us some good information um, and I think it's, it, it's a little hard to wrap your head around, so I think parents might have more questions than what they had. I'm going to try to walk you through it, but feel free to stop me as as we go so the accountability system measures your school and then it measures your district performance um, one of the other things that was thrown out the window is as you know uh, in the past schools assume the accountability uh, measure of their lowest performing school that no longer exists um, each school is uh, assessed on its own measure within you know the uh, reference that we'll talk about because they have several different categories now of what other schools they're comparing it with um, as far as the targets that they gave us we have not gotten a lot of feedback on how those targets were set so it'll be interesting to see what our targets look like next year we were just given a target here's your target we're like okay uh, we didn't know that that was our target but now that we do we can go from there um, the accountability is really supposed to measure two important questions how is the school doing and what kind of support does the school need um, when they made uh, districts assume the accountability of the, their lowest scoring school, they did that because they wanted you to allocate time, money, and resources into that school and say, okay, what's going on? Um, what's nice about Reading is we're doing that anyway. We don't need that kind of category. Uh, we are spending time at every school of like, okay, what does this actually mean? And how, how can we look at making continuous improvement? So we don't need that. Um, we are really looking at how is the school doing and what kind of support does it need? We're still answering those questions. So uh, some, some new system highlights. Um, it gives you information about school performance. Parents, in, they got their results either yesterday or today. They will still see the, the, um, their student scores in relation to their school scores, in relation to the district scores. Um, they're going to have information around that. Um, it also gives us Norvin criterion reference components, which I'll explain what that means. It also talks about accountability percentages and progress through towards targets and as I mentioned we're not sure uh, how the targets were created um, this happened when they started the MCAS system years ago those original targets weren't really explained and then as we went along we kind of understood it more um, there's more of a focus on the performance of each of each school's lowest performing students so that's new and I'm excited about that what they're basically saying is we want you to focus on the the lowest 25% of your school's test takers. And we're going to really ask you to make that achievement gap there. So you're not being compared to other schools. We're not looking, yes, the target still exists. But really your target is, 
how are we helping that lowest 25% make gains? And that's the achievement gap that the target is supposed to address. So that's exciting to me. Less c comparisons between other schools. You're really comparing your own self. So what does that mean? So for instance, if I'm a school district or a school that has very high scores, we're in the 96%. I still have my lowest 25%. <laughs> they may be also scoring very high, but they're my lowest 25%. They are now going to ask you to bump those scores up to meet the rest of the pack. If you are a school that has less than high scores, obviously your lowest 25, you're going to try. Because in the old system, there wasn't a lot of impetus for improving your overall scores. Because to lower the achievement gap, you either have to raise the lowest kids or lower your top kids. Now, Reading has never done that. We would never endorse that. I won't tell you that that hadn't happened. I would imagine that that is why they changed the system. Uh, so you're really comparing against your own weak, you know, um, kids that haven't tested as high and say really like where are they going with this? What are they doing? Um, and I'm excited about that because I think that is a more palatable and reasonable process than saying, all right, you have to close the achievement gap. With No Child Left Behind, it was like, all right, everyone has to get to 100. What? <laughs> yeah. You know, everyone here has to do, you know, 48 push-ups. And if you don't get to it, you fail. Like, eventually we'll all fail. And that's what happened with the original MCAS with the No Child Left Behind. So this is a very different system. And, and frankly, we were surprised by it. Uh, pleasantly surprised. Uh, yeah? So what do you, you haven't, this is obviously real new, but how do you think that's going to affect resources? I mean, we could have five different or uh, eight different schools. So I think, so I think again, the test only tests what is on the standards, okay? So as long as we're teaching what our great standards ask us to teach, we should be all set. What I can tell you is it, this gives schools a lot of autonomy for principals because we work so closely with the principals and you know when Gail and, and John and I and, and Sharon start sitting down with principals and saying, all right, what do you need? That's going to be part of the question. And different schools might need different things depending on their 25%. Absolutely. Um, in Reading, we don't have that much variation compared to some districts. But again, I, I have to admit, I was always a little annoyed with some of the higher achieving districts. I'm like, well, right, you don't have an achievement gap, so you don't have to worry about closing it. Because most of your kids score here, and the little kids who don't are here. Everyone has the lowest 25%, and they're going to ask you to bump those up. They're, they're looking at, and that, that, this is a state decision. I, I think it, it makes a much fairer playing field. I just do. All right, the, obviously the one to five, uh, d accountability is gone, um, and it's replaced with accountability category, categories that define the progress that schools are making and the kind of support. So we'll get to that. So as I said, um, ESA now requires states to include the following indicators. You have to do academic for ELA math and science. That's now a federal mandate. You have to measure student growth. Uh, in elementary and middle school. You have to look at graduation rates for high school. You have to look at uh, progress in achieving English proficiency if you have a certain number of uh, English language learners in a school or in a district, that is part of it. Um, in Reading's case, at the school levels, that's not part of it for us. Uh, we have a small percentage of ELL learners in this district. And then you have to have one measure of school quality or student success, and I'll explain what that means. So this is what Massachusetts has decided to do for non-high schools. Now what does that mean? The state uh, now compares schools in several categories. Non-high schools, which is elementary or middle schools up to grade 8, they're in one category, non-high schools. The second category, which we don't have, are uh, for uh, schools that have blended, blended like um, if they had a... a K to 6, I mean K to 8, or a 6 to 12 model. Some schools have middle schools and high schools in the same thing. And then high schools. So our, the two categories we're going to look at is non-high schools, which is all of five of our elementary schools. Our two middle schools are all in the same kind of way to, they're assessed the same way. And then we just have the one high school. Mm -hmm. So again, 
you might say, well, what difference does that make? It does make a difference because, again, if you're being compared apples to oranges and different schools have different things, it, it does definitely, it has impacted accountability in the past. So what they look at are these indicators and just these indicators. So for our non-high schools, so this is for all five of our schools plus our two middle schools, five of our elementary schools. They look at achievement, which that's that overall score we talked about in ELA and math and science, which is the old science test, the CPI, which is their achievement level. They look at student growth in ELA and math only. Then they look for English language proficiency if they have over a certain number of English language. And then they look at chronic absenteeism. Now, absenteeism has always been part of accountability um, in Massachusetts, as far as I can remember, perhaps since they started the MCAS system. John, is that true? Yeah. Um, and they, they use the number 95%. So again, 95% can be kind of deceiving. We overall have very high attendance rates, but then you have chronic kids. This is different now. So now what they look at is students that are absent more than 10% of their days in school. So you might say, okay, what does that mean? Well, that would be 18 days school. Wow. They come up as ding. Now, you know, we have some, not a lot in Reading, um, and we didn't get, we got full points on this, so attendance is not an area of relative weakness over Overall. But we do have some kids that have high attendance um, concerns, and that's something that the schools are working really, really hard on. Uh, it also means that if you have a student that either moved into the district or was not here for whatever reason, hospitalization, whatever, 10% of their days. So if you had a student move in in, say, January, and they were only here 90 days, but they missed more than nine days, they also come up as flagged. So that is a difference. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they don't have any like exceptions to that mm -mm. rule with someone that has a chronic illness or. or so we we code our absences and all of them are coded with I think only one exception. Correct, John? Right. The religious, religious uh, observances. Those are coded as like absences but non-absences uh, because of our school committee policy. But every other absence, we don't have the like bereavement. That's not a separate category. Um, hospitalization is in a separate category. The state is pretty strict about uh, how they code these things. And we have to code them according to the regulations. Okay. The good news is that we, we're, we don't have a problem with this. So, so, so if a student's at one school for half the year and they come to a second school and the second school is a public school, mm -hmm. They're counted, the, the state doesn't account for the fact that they were in school for so all they, of those days? So they do account for it, but the school, if they miss more than 10% in their new school, so this is this is particularly important for transient communities where kids move to multiple schools mm -hmm. and they may only be in your school for like 40 days, but they miss eight of them. Mm -hmm that those before were always tracked. So it's this percent of the days yep. that are left, yep. which could be a smaller number than 18, is what you're saying. Correct. It could be four. It could be, if you're in a school for 40 days, 10% is four days. So if you're absent five, you're now. And so I remember the efforts when we had the Joshua Eaton update, we talked yeah. about nine, I think, was the number of students that reached, it was like under 10. Under 10. So that's half of this, which is nice. As a district level, work. we try to look at 10. Um, Courtney runs the numbers periodically. Right now, I think we're looking at five absences at this point in the year and looking at those numbers and talking to principals about what are we doing, have we contacted, that these understood, da 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 da, da all okay. of that. I think because we do that, attendance isn't really an issue for us. Yeah. Uh, Again, we want kids to be here every day. <laughs> you know, I don't mean to say that we don't have some kids that are chronically absent. We do. Uh, so then this is the high school. Oh, um, Crystal, the one more. Sorry. Just because just it was on the slide. Okay. Um, English language learners. Yeah. Um, what? If you have a very tiny number in a school yeah. of English language, like one or two kids, could this potentially skew? We're not being we're not being assessed on that because oh. it's you not a big enough that. population. Yeah, that answers that. Thanks. But statewide, this is the yeah. Perfect. <laughs> so, and then now this is high school. Yeah. Okay, high school. So this is now grade nine. What they're looking at. So some of it's similar: ELA, math, science, achievement. Same deal. Student growth, PLA, math, same thing. Now, however, we have high school completion. And this, some of this is not new. Um, the graduation rate is not new. Uh, the extended engagement rate, I believe, is new. 
So what that means is, the extended um, engagement rate is kids that are uh, kids, we, as you know, we educate kids beyond high school. Some kids um, really need that support. Um, and uh, they look at the five-year cohort. So you didn't graduate in the four-year, but you're still there, you're still engaged, you're still, and they want that number to be high. So out of the four-year kids that didn't graduate, huh. how many of them stayed on for a fifth year and are still engaged? They're still coming. And what does that percentage look like? Um, so it's the, it's the graduation rate plus the percentage of the students that are still enrolled. What we don't want is kids not to graduate and then goodbye. We don't see them. Uh, and they're now looking at that. Again, not a huge area of, of issue for, for Reading, but statewide, you can understand. Uh, they also look at the annual dropout rate, which is not new. English language proficiency, again, same as the last category. The bottom ones are similar. The chronic absenteeism, it's 10% again. The other new one is this percentage of 11th and 12th graders completing advanced coursework. Advanced placement, international baccalaureate, dual enrollment, and other rigorous courses. So this is brand new and we had no idea it was coming. So what does this mean? This means uh, basically uh, most of our 11th and 12th math and science classes and it do not have international baccalaureate. Um, for those of you who know about that, that is a whole uh, philosophy that some schools use. Um, we do not currently think we have any dual enrollment. We're looking into, I know Kate Boyden and I, uh, just started our conversation about dual enrollment and what that would mean is that certain courses might comp for college credit. Um, some districts have been able to do that. Uh, that certainly requires a lot of energy around that and funding and things like that, but we're definitely looking into that. Um, it's basically any of the 11th and 12th grade math courses, any of the 11th and 12th grade science courses, and all the on AP courses in English, history, those courses. So uh, the state is now tracking percentage. Yes. So are they, are they, is that just percentage enrollment or like uh, completion at a certain level? Like I, particularly the AP, it's that's a, a very measurable, right? So they don't, they don't do like AP scores or any oh. of that. It's just who's enrolled right. in it. Yeah, it's enrollment. And it has nothing it's to do with what grade you got in it. It's just who actually is enrolled in it. Like right now, we just had to submit our October 1 uh, reports. So who is actually in these higher level courses? Um, you know what the, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, we, uh, it, you know what, the oh. what they're looking for? Oh. Um, well, let me get to the next, and then if you have more questions. So one of the things that's different is um, the accountability percentiles can't be really compared because it's a whole different universe. It's a whole different testing. The comparisons are very different. They added additional indicators in all areas, but certainly at the high school level. And there's fewer years of data use in the calculation, so just keep that in mind. Um, in addition, uh, just, I don't know if I have this on one of the slides, but they are now using student growth um, with uh, mean instead of median. So what does that mean? That was in the slide you did okay. on the so student growth. just keep that in mind too, that even the way they look at the student growth, they used to take the outliers, outlier, 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 that's the middle score. Now they do the average of all of them. So it definitely has um, impacted. So the schools are no longer categorized as one to five. The number of schools that are placed in a category based upon relative standing will be cut in half. So in other words, there are not going to be as many um, statewide schools that they're worried about, the level uh, three, fours, and fives. Most schools, um, well, 90% of the schools will be categorized based on their own performance against targets. Most schools will have 50% of its categorization based on the students that have been in the school for two years. So that was another thing. A lot of transient um, yeah. school districts with transient populations, yeah. they will often, and even in Reading, if we have somebody that we haven't educated for many years, we now own those scores. A lot of the um, targets are based on two years of testing. Mm -hmm. um, and category labels are primarily tied, tied to the level required of assistant intervention. I'll get to that. And a stronger emphasis on schools commended for success. Did that go? So this uh, slide looks like what I sent home in the memo. Um, 
Um, so 85% of the schools in the state are in those top categories, meeting targets and partially meeting targets. The schools of recognition um, came out after they kind of let everything else out. And to be honest with you, I was surprised. I kind of thought we might have one. Um, so we're right on that edge. They still haven't told us exactly what, what the percentage is were. Uh, where that's, they're still releasing that information. Um, but 85% of the school districts are in that meeting targets, partially meeting targets. And they've really kind of de-emphasized sort of that advanced and failing and really tried to focus all, like, let's get everyone to partially meeting, like every single person. Um, and so when we look at that, our performance targets will be reported in two categories. Um, next year, there'll be uh, three categories, not meeting targets. And then the, the, the lower 15%, of which thankfully we have no schools in that category, are in focused and targeted support and broad comprehensive support. And we don't have any schools that came anywhere close to that, which is great. So uh, districts are going to be classified based on the performances of the district as a whole. They basically average all the scores. We're no longer categorized on the lowest performing school, which I've already talked about. Uh, district accountability percentiles will not be calculated. They're not going to, um, they're classified based on criterion reference components, adjustments made for low graduation rates, and low um, assessment participation. That's um, another thing that we always have to look at is how many kids that should be tested are tested. So that's always uh, something that's really important that we make sure we test every kid. And you might say, well, of course you test every kid. But there are reasons why we don't. Sometimes kids are hospitalized. Some kind, sometimes kids um, leave our district and go to another school that they weren't um, on, you know, uh, taken off our registration in, in time for the window. So that's something we always look at. Um, and then the, the, obviously the state board designated district is underperforming or chronically underperforming. So these are all kind of new categories. So uh, the federal requirements are saying we want to put a lot of weight on achievement, progress, which is that student growth, English language proficiency, which is basically you learn English within six years. That's what they're looking for. And graduation rates. Together, they're giving them a lot more sort of percentages of the overall accountability. And Massachusetts has done that as well. All indicators had to be included in the weighting. Progress to English language learner proficiency only applies to a subset of school. So it, it, in, in our case, not. Um, the ratio between achievement and growth will be a constant between non-high schools and high schools, but actual weights will differ. I'll get to that slide. And then the, um, the State Department intends to apply the same weighting rules to both normative and criterion. Next year with the new test, we should be all in the same. There won't be two separate uh, accountability measures. Um, and the uh, department said they're going to um, have a three to one ratio. So achievement counts three times, growth counts one. So this, if you look at this, this is non high schools. Our current rating is three to one. We're in the no ELL category. So 67.5% of our rating is just on achievement on scale scores, ELA, math, and science. 22.5% is on student growth because we don't have English language proficiency. They don't, they're not doing that 10%. And then we have chronic absenteeism is 10%. So that's basically how they determine the accountability for each of our seven schools that are non-high schools. In the high school, they, uh, again, have the same 3 to 1 ratio. 47.5 is in ELA, ELA math and science achievement. But you can see that student growth for us is 22.5. So keep that in mind with the high school accountability. Growth is measured quite a bit um, because we don't have an ELA, ELL percentage. Uh, so they look at the same thing with non-high schools, 22.5% is student growth. So if we had ELL, it would be 20, but because of that, it's 22.5. The high school completion is at 20%. And then we don't have the ELL, but then we also have that chronic absenteeism in the percentage of students completing advanced coursework is 10%. That's combined. So just a quick question. So they end up, that 10% is, so right now you, you might report how many are enrolled, but 
it, it ends up being based on how many completed with a passing grade on that? No. Okay. How many are enrolled? Really? So, so it bothers me. Yeah. Do they? Can I ask? A, yes. Do they give an wrong. explanation? I mean, why they want to have more kids in higher those? level courses. I understand yeah. that, but why? Why are they? You get, you're only getting 10 points for in the kind of the well because right the state the federal government actually requires that uh, performance be your highest percentage point so they know that the actual scale score is is like the big umbrella and then you have growth and then you have um, graduation rate and you have other things the um, the other category that the federal government says you can choose is defined by law is the smallest it has to be the smallest percentage yeah mm -hmm. oh, oh yeah mm -hmm. this they isn't a massachusetts things to look at. this is what massachusetts chose. Mm -hmm. okay so when we talk about uh the normative component well accountabilities were given a percentage point a percentile of one to 99 calculating using all of those indicators that we talked about and it compares schools administering similar statewide assessments and it's used to identify the lowest performing, that's the 15% that's needed support. And the same calculation was used at the subgroup level. So um, although because I'm doing the 5,000 for you, we're not gonna get into the subgroups, anything with 20 or more students that tested at a grade level will also have subgroup scores as well. And those are all available on the DESE website. Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind. So schools are grouped and compared based on the assessments administered in 2018. Non-high schools are, this is what I talked about, are those three to eight grades. They, they did the next generation math and ELA, um, as well as the uh, legacy science. Uh, the middle category of, of those hybrid schools that may have uh, high school kids, elementary or middle school, some districts have K-12 schools even. Um, and then high school is the uh, the only grade tested is 10th grade. Now that, again, the state calls the science test a 10th grade test. In Reading, it's a 9th grade test, but the state determines that they call it a 10th grade science test. And they, um, last year, only administered legacy tests. So we only have schools in the top category and the bottom category. So then when we look at criterion reference component, they're focusing on closing the achievement gap by raising the achievement floor. So the gap closing can, can occur as a result of decline in, in your performance. This is what I talked about, is raising your, your lowest scores, but you could also lower your highest scores. They're not doing that anymore. Um, in addition to meeting targets, the performance of the lowest performing students, which is the 25% lowest testers, um, every school has its own group of lowest performers, and they're identified from the cohort of students who are enrolled. In the past, we never had access to that. We had access to kids that were in our high need subgroups, mm -hmm. if we had more than 20. But you never knew exactly who were, who were that, that group that you really wanted to focus on the achievement gap. Because <clears throat> they also categorized, like for instance, um, if you're a child on an IEP, if there's more than 20 at that grade level, you're in that whole pile, you could have tested really, really well, and that percentage point is in that. So it doesn't always give you a great understanding of like, well, who are the kids that we really need to focus on that might need support in doing what we need them to do, which is meet expectations. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is the best part. You have something to add? So we got four points. So this is when Jeffrey asked that question earlier, Jeffrey, this is what I was talking about. You, with the criterion reference component, you can get up to four points. Again, to me, like a four is an A, right? Like, but no, in the state's determination, three is really what they're expecting. That's that meat method target. That's really, that's like anything above that's gravy, but really the three is, is the score. Uh, zero means you declined, no change is one, Improved is two, met target is three, exceeded target is four. So even when we start making our own sort of benchmarks of like, what would we like to see? We're going to be using target. We, that's, we would like every kid to meet targets. So that's where we're at. So the highlights are schools and districts receive an overall classification of not requiring assistance or intervention. Uh, we also um, 
had no technical assistance in the area of special education. So when they looked at all our set groups across the board, we had absolutely no technical assistance needed, which that is an improvement for us. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited about that. Um, so these are really small, so I'm going to kind of talk you through them. And I might have to change eyeglasses to do so. So this one here is, uh, this is right from the DESE website. And this is our overall accountability. And I don't know if you can see it from where you are. No. But our overall classification is partially meeting targets at 66% of partially meeting targets. So 0 to 75 is that partially meeting target. So 66 puts us on the higher end of partially meeting targets as a district. And we're going to talk about that. So this is also on uh, the Jesse website as well. And this is our district. Now, it's hard to read, but if you look in your packets, if you, if you have them, we look at the points here. So if you look in the all students category, which is, now this is um, the whole district. So they're looking at the high school, they're looking at the non-high schools, all of it. So for instance, English language achievement, we had up to four points we could have earned, four points beaming that we exceeded expectations, we got four points. Uh, with math achievement, we received two, which if you go back, means that we improved, but we didn't quite meet the target. And again, we were given no guidance on what the new targets would be. Okay? Uh, so a two sounds bad, but it really means we improved. It just means we didn't meet the target that they set. Uh, and as we get more used to this new accountability system, we'll start looking at those targets uh, and tracking, oh, okay, well, it was you know this target this year, and then next year, when we get the 2019, we'll be like, oh, okay, go up much, so the target stayed the same. Okay, great. Um, we had no idea what the targets would be this past year, obviously. <coughs> so then when you look at uh, the next <coughs> column, which is hard to read, is that lowest performance students of non-high school. So those are uh, that 25% across the district that, you know, but again, in English language learners, even those kids, they made significant gains. They met the targets. They're, we got three points for that. And in math, we exceeded our targets in that, in that group. So we got four points for that, which is great. So one of the things that we look at, okay, now go to the next category. That's all students high school. English language learners uh, achievement, we got four points out of a possible four, which again is exceeding targets. But with math achievement, we only got a one, which meant that when you go through, no change. So it doesn't mean that we went down, it just meant that we didn't really change. And we certainly didn't meet our target, and we didn't improve. Um, some of the things that we're definitely looking at, uh, along with science achievement, the, the high school scores, we did get some ones and twos. Again, three is what we're going for. We got a lot of threes, our four-year graduation rate, three, extended engagement rate, three, annual dropout rate, three, which means that we met the target, met the target, met the target, and that, by meeting the target, that means an improvement. Um, chronic absenteeism across the board, uh, we either met the target or improved. Um, we do have a cohort of lowest performers at the element at the non-high school level that we're going to look at because we didn't meet the target there. Yeah. Yes. So when I look, it's in, I'm looking at the big table with yeah. squinting eyes, but it looks like the this lowest. One? Yeah. Yeah. So the lowest perform. I was comparing the lowest performing students. Yeah. Non high school versus high school left right. And the thing that strikes me initially is that you have a two for chronic absenteeism on the, on the left side mm -hmm. for the non high school. Mm -hmm. Right. So would suggest I don't remember the scale, but suggest it's less than a three. It's, yeah. right. it's improving, but not right. not to the standard they they've set or you know without us knowing it. And. So that to me seems like a clear idea that, okay, the lower performing students, there's something going on with their measure of attendance, right? So to right. me, that they intuitively- improved, but they didn't meet the target. The it, but that, that kind of makes sense to me yeah. intuitively. If you go to the high school side, it's, it's almost the opposite. You have an exceeding target of four for the lowest performing yeah. students for uh, attendance, but then zeros, which are for both math 
in English. And that jumps out at me. Like, you're, right. you're exceeding expectations for having the kids in the building. That's right. good. Yeah, but, but then when they're in the building, they're declining. Yeah, and, and maybe that's just to, a small It all has decline. to do with the targets that the state set, too. So you have to realize well, one isn't But it's a decline, means. though, right? It's a zero is a decline. A zero is, is a decline, decline right. but one is no change. Right. So decline we did, have, we did have a math decline this year. We know that. We had a science decline. So is any decline a decline, right? So even no matter Anything how that, small? If the score is lower than last year, that's a decline. Even if it's a very modest change? Yes. If it's point one, we had one decline. At, at some point, you run out of... We had one decline. Runway, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, look I mean, at, you know, again, this accountability system isn't perfect. In my opinion, it's fairer than it the It makes first. a lot of sense in the middle. It makes <laughs> a lot of sense in the middle, but yeah. it starts to fall apart toward the top. Yeah. And I think that's what we yes. have with the right. whole system, too. So, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we have looked at, um, because it's new for us and because we got zero points, is um, our additional indicators for the advanced coursework. Yeah, so um, we got zero points for that. Okay. And um, that is because we went down with percentage. We went from 64.6 to 60.9. However, and again, that means that 64% of our kids in, in the uh, 20 kids? advanced courses, which is, is huge, in, right? In real terms, of uh, 25 kids? It's probably kids? less than that. However, <laughs> the other thing that you have to realize, and I probably wrote it down here, but maybe I didn't, is that our numbers were a lot higher. Uh, the year before, lap, this past 2018 yeah. graduating class was much, much smaller than the year before. The year before was the highest graduating and, class. And it's not percentage-based, it's absolute it's numbers. It's not percentage-based, it's absolute numbers. Right. Uh -huh. So if you have a bigger class, you'll do better, and if you have a smaller class, oh, yeah. it, it will be represented negatively here. And what if you're, I'm sorry, but what if you're in a district where there's enrollment change? I mean, there are some districts that are seeing a close of growth in a high school or the other. Right. There's population moving so up. So then they would get those points changed. So they get a zero. Yeah. That's I mean, really we went from weird. here, I did write it down. We went from 532 uh, students enrolled in 2017 to 460. Uh, and as you really get a little bit of percentage. In AP and the higher level right classes. And then this year, as it stands right now, we have 584. So that's a marked improvement. So that should be something that we most likely, I would say, would get a three or four. 584 students in, in advanced in play. That means each class. So that we have kids that take three, Multiple four, classes. five, eight, nine. It doesn't mean 584 out of the 1,200. Yeah. yeah. It, it means 584 out of possible seats in every class. Yeah. Right? I, I saw that. I remember the presentations yeah. where we saw all the numbers high number of honors and AP students yeah. at the high school and I saw the I mean, zero. it's definitely something we continue to work on. We always want to have higher level courses, but the reality is we do have a lot of kids taking those courses. Uh, the reason why we didn't get points in that is because we went down percentage-wise in one year. Next year we'll be waiting. So, uh, you know, uh, yeah. we, we had no idea they would even be looking at that. Yes. So when I'm looking at this, Chris, I'm just trying to compare it to where we've provided resources where yeah. we need to provide resources. Yeah. So I look at the the lower ones, you know, I mean, after you go below achievement, I, I look at a lot of those that are, I would tie to a lot of the resources we put towards the social emotional type categories in, in the budget. Uh, I, I yet, think there's a direct correlation. Yeah, yeah. and yet, uh, when you look at, I mean, I think we should, you know, I'm not saying we're not doing it. Uh, I know one is, is, no, is change. no change, but we should be looking at, at, at math and science. Right, uh, at the high school. At the high school as, as a focus area. Yeah, I mean, I and think I guess, we're John, all that's, that, that's, I wouldn't, I meant you too. Yeah, so. Well, I think we're surprised with the high school scores in general. Again, mm -hmm. they're already at a high point. So keep that in mind. Right. Yeah. That once you get into the high 80s and 90s, it's really hard to continue to improve. It's, it's easy to drop down a little bit or a few points. The reality is you get, you get dinged on that. You have to at least get what you got last year and then some. So to get a three, you have to meet your target, which is higher than what you did last year. Right, 88% okay. advanced and proficient, right? Do I just have to wait? No, I don't know what Great. Battery? Jeez. We'll keep us there at home, right? Wait, we need, we need a oh, socks up. JD Martinez did. One zero, one zero boss. boss. Right. Thank you. Price is pitching, by the way. Oh. Uh -huh.
and it's still zero. Oh. They so had a little the they teaser there at the end <laughs> of the day, and they said that the sale may be healthy enough uh, to pitch. That's what. So while John's uh, figuring out my computer woes, um, if you go to the slide where I uh, have all of the schools listed of what their percentage is towards improving targets. So again, it's all about targets and we have not been given a lot of guidance yet on where, how they set the targets or what they will look like this following year. So that is something that uh, we'll be uh, attending DESE. We've already attended several webinars. Anything that DESE provides with any of the accountability, myself or my staff have been heavily involved in. Um, so we are definitely trying to get ahead of the curve on this. Uh, Barrows, uh, it, all of our schools luckily doesn't require any targeted assistance or intervention of any kind, which is makes us in that 85% um, category. Uh, so our progress towards meeting targets, they basically take two columns. They say, okay, your progress towards your targets and then your accountability percentile. And they're sort of related, but yet not. Um, so the progress towards targets is like, we set those targets, how close were you to, to getting to them? So for instance, um, kill them, for instance, 90% meeting targets. Um, Joshua Eaton, 93% meeting targets. Um, Coolidge, 87 meeting targets. You can see why I thought we might have a couple of schools on that distinction list. Uh, those are really, really high percentages. When I talk to other um, area districts, most districts are not having 90% um, meeting targets. That's a very high percentage. The targets were very, very um, high this year. Uh, but then the accountability percentile, that's that last column. Um, obviously, the schools that had a higher uh, percentage. Uh, do you know what happened, John? Yep. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Battery died. I'm glad it wasn't something I did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we'll keep going. So, I mean, all of our schools did fairly similarly with our accountability percentile. Again, from the district-wide percent percentage, I'm always looking at our elementary schools, I would like them to be within the same range, right? Um, I would like our two middle schools to be within the same range. Here's the slide I'm talking about. So when you look at Barrow, 74%, Birch Meadow, 75%, I gotta put my glasses on, Eaton, 81%, uh, Killam, 79%, Wood End, 77%. So they're all kind of within the same category of accountability percentile. And that's compared to all the schools in the state. Um, Coolidge obviously had a real bump in scores this year. They really blew some of the um, targets out of the water. So they're at 91% and Parker is at 77%. But again, I think I, will be, I wouldn't be surprised if that was reversed next year. Um, it could be, and again, that, that, that's no disrespect to the strong work that goes on at Coolidge. It just means that there's also equally strong work going on at Parker. Um, and then RMHS is definitely an area that we're looking at um, our, you know they, the account the old accountability system didn't look at all of the meeting targets the same way this new one does um, and because our scores were high we just kind of the high school was like its own category and I think you know that having sat through these presentations before this year we were assessed differently and our scores uh, definitely um, reflect that again most of our kids do really well on the high school MCAS. It's just that certainly we didn't meet the targets that the state set out for us, and our accountability percentile is based on those target meeting measures. So those are where the, those zeros and ones and twos versus threes. Uh, three is definitely the, the, the point that we're looking for. So. Um, Chris, just, uh, it's clearly going to take me a little bit longer to you know get my brain wrapped around this. But yep. the, right, so but the 
I mean, the proficient in higher was 90, the state's 91 and we were 96. Right. And the state is 78 on math and we're 80, 88. We're higher than the state, well higher. Right. And the same thing with the um, mm -hmm. science and teaching in 10th grade, right, 74, 81. So I, I, I know I don't have my, my I'm not fully um, immersed in the targets, this, par this partially meaning targets metric. So I'll give an example. The target set for us in ELA for this year was 100. That was the target. The target in ELA for high school. We were at 98.9 in 17. We were at 98.3 this year. So we're at 98.3 CPI, which is not scaled scores. So, so we are that close to, four to 100, but because we didn't meet our target, we didn't get the points. Everyone would have had to have gotten a perfect score to get a four. Right. And uh, same with, ma and I don't mean to undermine the fact that we can't do better, because we know we can. But the reality is that we didn't, we can't reach 100, we can't. So uh, with math, the target was 98.6, and we went down a bit, but we still, our overall CPI index for math was 94.6. Mm -hmm. So that's not a scaled score. What you're talking about with the 88 is yeah. scaled score. Our overall CPI index for math is 94.6, which puts us in a very high category. Yes, Mr. Bovin. So other than the enrollment in higher classes, whatever it's advanced course, it's course are all of the other measurements percentage-based or kind of uh, a reflection of an average of scores? among all the students in there? So, sort of. <laughs> so, uh, so some, all of the new next generations are more so. The old legacies still use the CPI index, which is this compilation, very complicated with the last four, four testings, and they have, you know, they take 100% of this year's score, 75% of last right, year, right. Know, all, I mean, I know you've been through it. That's going away, so. So, has there been any feedback or opportunity for feedback to the state or to folks over in Malden at the state education. It seems to me that what the example you just gave is a really great one. You have a tenth or a quarter of a percent point difference in scores and you go to zero. It would be much more, it just seems to create a huge amount of noise across the state, right? We have a lot of zeros that are meaningful. If I were in the state, I'm not, but it would be more meaningful to say, was there a dip above a threshold, like more than a 10% oh. dip or a 5% dip, like something like that, that'll take the noise out. And the same thing for the advanced coursework. If you have a class that's 350 kids, the next one's 310, yeah. you may actually have increased your participation yeah. in courses and it may look like a decrease. So mm -hmm. is there any mechanism for comment? So this, the, so yes and no. Okay. Um, the state will always listen to what we say, but then we get the accountability the week before the tests are re released. So I don't know, I don't have that answer. When they rolled out the system, um, there was public hearings on yep. the system uh, from you know the the public could comment on it so there was a public comment period remember too though the state has to follow certain guidelines right. we have to the the federal government has to approve the accountability system for each state so we have we have certain restrictions with the federal law that we have to follow so the end, the end of the story is that Reading did very well in the MCAS. Uh, the, account, the new accountability system measures that. Um, we were very happily, um, you know, I think we were happily renewed in our faith that, yes, this accountability system kind of measures what we already knew to be true, that many of our kids are doing well. And the kids that aren't, that um, lowest 25 percent, we're now really given the authority to really focus on that, rather than just a continuous improvement, 100 percent. We have to get to 100. You know. Now I will tell you that that target, those targets are always our bugaboo. They always are, because uh, like if you have a target of 100, how do you get there? Um, but this accountability system doesn't solely rest on that. It has other components. Um, and I think, you know, Kate and I have talked uh, quite a bit about the high school scores, and we're going to continue to talk. There are things that we know as a school we can do that might impact our overall rating. Um, because our high school is strong. Our scores are strong. And, and we're going to take a look at unpacking that. 
question? Yes. What is the lowest performing, what's the definition of that? Maybe so it's just achievement. No, but what percentage is that? 25%. The bottom 20, mm -hmm. that is that same? In that school, yep. And 20 across the district. In school, okay. In every school. In every, in every school in the state. Across mm -hmm. any student demographic, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. So it's not that subgroup stuff that they yeah, used yeah. to do. I mean, we still get those scores, but. And it's the last year's bottom 25%. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Subgroups, you know, we don't get the scores if there's fewer than 20 kids. Are we still held accountable? For example, in the past with Eaton, it was the poor performance of the special ed subgroups. And sometimes we saw it because there were 10 yeah. kids in a grade, and then sometimes we didn't. So even though we don't get Back to the numbers of not requiring technical assistance, would the state let us know if Oh, that's that. The students are really at school. Yep. Even though it's less than 20. So when you go on to the portal, uh, which the, anybody has access to, and you go to that detailed report, it actually gives, there's a pull-down menu, and you can look at every single subgroup separately in that same graph. So it looks exactly like this one. Hold on. Even if there's fewer than 20 kids? Only if there's 20 or more. So it, what happens if uh, the grade to look at it. Bridge in so then they're in the aggregate. They're just in the whole group. So our district doesn't learn about that? Oh, no, we, we do it, but we don't get public. Yeah, no, no, no. We absolutely look at each cohort. That's why when I said we're digging deeper, we're spending time to look at every single cohort, every single group. What was the surprising? You know, are there kids that we kind of knew that math might be an area of, of you know, concern? Were there kids that were shocks to us? Those kind of things. We absolutely are drilling down to that level. Oh, yeah. The state just doesn't report out on those. Mrs. Williams? Yes? I have a second question to follow up that. How do you keep track of those kids? So how do you know that there's most of the bottom, like in that population? So the state has given us access to those those uh, numbers, the, who those kids are, the 25%. Right, I'm saying when they take the test, how are they it, it has to do with what their score is. So after they take it, then the score determines, their score determines, and each year's score from what I, from what I can gather, each year's score will develop a new list. Of the lowest 25% mm -hmm. that you, that, yeah. It may not be the same. You could be on a list one year and then not on the list another right. year. So it's, you're always yep. focusing on the lowest 25% that right. that test code, that whole what else code. What else it does away with is that old CPI system held you hostage for four years. Yeah. If you had a, a, a cohort year, you know this to be true, because we had it in Reading. You owned it 100%, then 75, then 50, then This, it, every year, is kind of a new system. You take that 25% and you look at that number. But it could be different kids. But you have access to who, you you do the district does we do. access to yep. who those students yep. are so that you can identify yes. groupings, individuals, yes. you know, kids who So as we set up intervention groups, that's part of our conversation. Again, MCAS is one snapshot. Uh, and there are kids that absolutely don't test well, but then in class are, are meeting standards day to day. So but we definitely are looking at that. Yep. Oh Sprowski. So I just want to make some global comments about this, and I'm still, there's a lot. There is it's a lot. It's really different. Um, but I think I tend to share your optimism about this as an improvement over the old yeah. accountability system for a lot of the reasons you articulated. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm eager to learn more and see how the next few years look, but I think there is real improvement in this. Um, and I agree. I'm glad that you're you know looking at the high school. I think that merits a close look. And the Parker Coolidge divide, um, I hear what you're saying, but I also agree, yeah, second year where there's a similar divide probably does merit a real conversation. But I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. I, I just think given um, historical information of the scores mm -hmm. in, in the different accountability system, yeah. they were never that different. Yeah. Right. So, and again, we didn't know what the targets were. Absolutely. So we, we need to see if we have another year, we're we, now, yeah. now, yeah. So that, and that was, I had a very similar reaction before your presentation, so I had a very similar thought. The only other thing I wanted to add is I think the elementary scores are really, really excellent. And I'm sure I'm not going to be the only one to say it, but particularly at Eaton, Mm -hmm. I mean, 
a lot of people have been doing a lot of really good work for a lot of years to see this kind of improvement. And I, you know, we were the first group to hold accountability and, and require regular updates to the school committee, but I think we should be the first to honor some real, um, real significant achievements. Yeah, when, when our about. scores opened up, when we got the window, because we got the raw scores, but you didn't know, you know, it looked, we were cautiously optimistic that we had made gains, but you don't really know until they release that. And um, I immediately called Lisa Marie to tell her. And, you know, I just, my hat goes off to all of the elementary principals. They're really mindful of this. Um, but we did have a school that was, you know, working really, really hard to try to get out of that level three status. And I think this is a real testimony to the hard work that's gone on in that school because those are really solid scores. They're not just solid for Reading, they're solid for everywhere. So. That's what's striking about yeah. them, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Doctor. So maybe I should understand this better. Okay, we're um, still learning, Linda. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so when you talk about not knowing what the targets were going to be mm -hmm. and that now what would you do differently? So you'll be thinking about what you would yeah. do differently. I'm hearing that and then I'm hearing that we don't teach to the test. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to figure out how how those two reconcile. So I'll give you an example. Thank you. So in the past when we had our targets, originally with no child left behind, the target was 100, right? And they took every year's test and divided by how many more cycles and you had to go up four points or whatever to get to 100. So everyone reached the cliff at some point, right? Um, then they changed it and they said, oh, we made it a little bit more accessible and now it's only to like 90, more or less. Um, so as a school, as a principal for many years, I was able to say, oh, okay. So knowing that I have to get to approximately 90, where are we now, right? And how am I going to make those gains each year? So um, there are things that we looked at in those days, more so. Um, a lot of them were, were simple things like if we could get two more kids into the advanced category and get those bonus points, then we, we could make that, that okay? This, does, this system doesn't include that. This is all about meeting targets, which again, we still, still don't know where those targets are. Um, there, there's gonna be more information about how they set the targets, and I think after this next cycle, we'll have a better idea. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the targets, do principals pay attention to the targets? Absolutely. However, do we say to teachers, you must reach that target, do whatever you can, drill, 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 practice, 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 no, we don't. We say, let's have some strong teaching, let's teach to the standards, which is the requirement and let's look for kids that may need more intervention to get to that level mm -hmm. you know that be, that middle of the um, bullseye I always say our work here is like the bullseye the bullseyes the have to know that's the standards that's really what the MCAS tests the the you know that um, exceeding expectations category that's that outer rim of the bullseye and and frankly that's great if we achieve that and we have many many kids who do but really our number one priority is that middle um, and that's what MCAS is really seeks to look at and and I'm excited that they got rid of a lot of that stuff like we don't care how many advanced kids you have we we want to focus <coughs> on getting everyone to meeting expectations and I think for Reading, that's a very reasonable goal. And one that we'll probably spend my the rest of my career working on. So. <laughs> I'm hearing you and I really appreciate that that support will be there and that uh, focus is on the standards. Yep. Um, since it's obvious that those that are already scoring really well, yeah. the detriment is that if they just like you make a wrong choice on a on a question and they get that wrong they can easily slip they can um, but what if any impact is this going to have on the focus of those who do well and can be engaged to take on more challenges and do better like so again at the high school case. level I mean I think MCAS is just a day to them, right? Uh, they know they needed to graduate. Many kids in our school do really well in the MCAS, and it's just another test for them, right? Um, most of the tests that they have in their regular classes are harder than the MCAS. So I, I don't think it's going to impact them a lot. I mean, I, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time trying to make sure advanced kids get advanced or whatever. We're just going to keep doing great teaching and work on better ways to, to make that happen. So and, and those scores will just, I mean, are we going to get to 100? No. 
like I said, none of, if we said 100% of us are going to do 48 push-ups, we couldn't all do it, even if we practiced every day. Um, there's no way to get to 100. But we're, at the high school level, we're, we're pretty close in a lot of areas. So let's, um, we still have two items and an executive session. Okay. So any other I, questions? I, I jumped ahead to your very If you last have slide. any other questions after this, you know, feel free to reach out to me individually. Thank you. That Thank you. That John, I don't know why this doesn't seem to be keep on clicking. <laughs> Maybe this battery. We don't need it for the other two items anymore. No, you don't. That was amazing. Um, so I'm going to make the next motion, and um, that is, uh, it's related to the MASC MAS conference, which is coming up in November um, 6th, 7th, 8th. Right now we have um, Dr. Dr. and Ms. Borowski both attending, and perhaps um, Dr. Dan Macker. So uh, what we'd like to do is um, appoint a, a delegate. There's a delegate assembly there. Um, I personally have attended this delegate assembly a couple of times when uh, my previous tenure from 2003 to 2010 and had also represented the committee as a delegate. I mean, the committee as a delegate to the assembly. There's a lot of discussion that happens at the assembly. Um, I consulted with Dorothy Sir our MAS um, C rep. And, um, you know, the recommendation is that we basically make the vote to appoint Dr. Doxer as our delegate. Um, and um, Mrs. Borowski as the alternate. So I second by right. right. Chuck. So right now we're they basically will act on our behalf and represent basically the 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 leaning and the 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 sort of the will of the committee and um, we're counting on how to do that. We're not really gonna talk specifically about resolutions tonight. It's uh, pretty late. But I assume when Mrs. Borowski and Dr. Doxa come back from the conference, we'll uh, coordinate with them on what kind of report they'll do back to the committee. And I'm sure that includes some information on the resolutions. So um, if there's no further discussion, we'll take a vote. All those in favor? Yes. So that's five zero. And the other very quick thing, you guys had something at your um, table, and um, basically this came through Ann Landry, who sort of took took this upon um, herself in collaboration with Red. And um, basically on Sunday at noontime, the Reading community is going to gather on the town common in solidarity with the Jewish community to stand in opposition to anti-Semitism. And really, uh, in talking to Ann, the whole idea is to just put the community together um, in opposition to hate and, and to show our strong support. The Miss Landry brought this, and Landry brought this to um, the select board on Tuesday night. It was something that was happening very quickly. So it is happening this Sunday, which I recognize is really difficult um, for people to sort of find out on a Wednesday that, um, you know, there's this rally on Sunday. And um, I encourage committee members to attend, um, but fully understand that. Um, that might not be possible given, you know, plans this week. And um, Dr. Darty, I, Dr. Darty needs to be there. <laughs> and he knows, we know that, we understand that. Um, it's important and um, so he certainly has agreed. He will be there, he has changed his plans and will certainly represent the district. So I want, um, you make the motion? Uh, we'll put the motion and then, yeah, yeah. I move to support the joint joint sponsorship, the select board in red, of the rally against anti-Semitism held on Reading Common on October 21st. Start. Starts, thank you. It starts at noon, so it's after, as uh, Pastor Jamie Michaels said at the red meeting, it's after church, but before the football games. Exactly. Yeah. So who are the elected officials that are speaking? So I will say that Anne left this sufficiently vague because it hadn't been decided, but she needed to get something out. So I don't exact, I don't know that. I would indicate that if for the school committee, if she wanted a statement or something, that I would be there and I would make that statement. And um, Dr. Ornstein is going to be there on the agenda. Um, and the other element is and I believe she put this together. Either she got some new quotes, or she took. I just we I just got this like, half hour before yeah, the meeting. Right at 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 five thirty, this yeah. flyer came. So, um, so anyway, we'd like to 
you know, see if the school committee would weigh the support. So if there's any other discussion, all those in favor? Great. So we can report to, um, yeah, I'll, I'll text Ann, but Linda, can you, you'll officially make that. There, our last motion. No. But I don't, it's a, it's a public event rally on the common. I'm not anticipating so that we need to be posted. No, you don't need to, no, you don't need yeah. to post. Yeah. No. No. It's like the kind of thing that you could all end up showing yeah. up at. Can you read the last motion? The last motion mm -hmm. is to protect the bargaining position of the board, move to enter executive session to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining, negotiation strategies with respect to non-represented personnel, and not to return to open session. And with the roll call, Mr. Boyden? Yes. Mrs. Sebrowski? Yes. Mrs. Robinson? Yes. Mrs. Webb? Yes. Dr. Yes. Doctor. Yes. All right. Any to executive session?